Good evening, everybody. This is June 10th. It, this is a special meeting of the Northampton City Council. I'm Gina Louise Shara. I will be presiding this evening. This meeting and all who participate on it with us on Zoom will be audio and video recorded. There's only one item on the agenda for this evening, which is the continuation of the discussion of the approval of the general fund budget, which is now order 20.065. Um, but called special meetings of the council do not follow our order of business for a regular meeting of the city council in our rules. They don't, follow, they don't have that same order of business. There is no provision for public comment for a special meeting. I know that the council is really eager to get back to the discussion we suspended after 2 a.m. last Thursday, and there was a hope to take it up immediately at 5 p.m. today, but I made the decision to add a um, up to a two-hour period of public comment before we convene, so that is what we're going to start with. So we'll begin with public comment. I will apply the same rules to this public comment as to our regular meeting. You may speak to us on any topic. As the information for this meeting has been shared very widely on social media, which is how Zoom bombers find meetings to infiltrate and fill with hate, we will try very carefully to protect against this. Um, for this reason, and also because of the size of this meeting, all participants will need to be muted until called upon. We will do our best to act quickly if someone is clearly acting in a way that is inappropriate, deploying profanity or slurs, or displaying audibly or visually something outside of what we would expect in council chambers. I will remove anyone that needs to be removed from the meeting. To be able to see the council, which is the body to whom all comments should be directed, I request that you turn off your video unless you have the floor. If you don't wish to make a comment, we encourage you to watch on channel 15, or someone will correct me if it's not channel 15 tonight, um, or by streaming on Northampton Open Media. The recording of this meeting will be available at Northampton Open Media's government video archive channel on YouTube, and I thank them as always for providing this public access. To make a public comment, please use the raise hand feature. That is how I will know you want to comment and can recognize you. To raise your virtual hand, you click on the participants in the horizontal menu bar at the bottom of the screen. A column will open up with the participants of the meeting. The raised hand feature is at the bottom of that column. If you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by hitting star nine. If you're having trouble raising your hand, you may use that use the chat feature, which is also in that bottle, bottom menu bar, um, to send a message to me. I will do my best to monitor that, but that is the only purpose for which we will use that function, and it will only be used during public comment. I will unmute each raised hand in order. You may comment with or without video. When you begin, please state your name and your city or town of residence for the record. We do not respond during public comment as, as it is your time to speak. So while your comments should be directed to us, you will understand when we don't respond. We will hear comment for up to two hours. Those two hours do not include these instructions by me. I will not take up that space. Um, I will begin the two hours when public comment begins. To ensure everyone has equal opportunity, each person has up to three minutes of time. I will begin the timer when you start speaking. If you use all the time, you will hear a tone at three minutes and I will ask you to finish the sentence you're speaking. Making the timer heard has been a challenge and I'm trying yet another method tonight. Um, I'm sorry that you can't see the clock since I know people like to know how much time they have remaining. Laura, the IT director and I have spent a lot of time trying to find a timer with an audible alert for a certain amount of time left um, and we haven't found one. If you know of one, <laughs> please share it with us. We've been trying to find one. Um, the, the only way that I can figure out how to show you the timer is would be to share my screen, but the speaker has the floor during public comment, not me, and I don't want to take over that. Um, you can always email your comment to us at citycouncil at northamptonma.gov. If you email there, you don't need to email us individually. Laura forwards all correspondence to all of us. I know there's an interest in allowing new voices, voices who haven't been involved before, Voices who have been underrepresented or not comfortable participating, we, and I know you, want to elevate the voices of black and brown people who are most affected by the topic that I think it's safe to say most of you are here to speak on. Here's the thing, you all have to make space. 
I have a list of names or handles that I have to go down on this list. I don't have another way to do this. If you've spoken to us in the last seven hours of comment and testimony, maybe more than once, if you've emailed us, we've heard you. I promise you that we have listened to all of that testimony and we've read your emails. Um, I understand you may have new things to say tonight, but I just ask that you think of if someone else might need to speak and need that time. If you wanna say something that's already been said, please indicate that briefly. You can say ditto, you can say I concur, I agree. You have up to three minutes, you don't need to use it all. We never have, nor do we have the capacity to apply yielded time. Um, but by using less than three minutes or saying, I agree with what's already been said, you are saving that time and yielding it to someone else. So we're gonna begin now. I will call on people for two hours or until the last hand is raised, whichever is sooner. So give me a moment to get the timer set up. I'm hoping it's gonna be audible, we'll see. <clears throat> And the first name, hold on one sec. Uh, yes, I will provide the email address for public comment in a second. Um, you can do that. Oh, okay, thank you, Laura. Um, the first name on the list is Sasha Bratton. I'm gonna unmute you or ask to unmute you. Sasha? Can you hear me? Yes, you're unmuted. Great, thank you. Sure. My name's Sasha, I live in East Hampton. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak. We won't waste any time. There's an unprecedented public outcry demanding reduced policing in the community. If you do not defund the police department this year, it will show you are committed to working against the public, laid bare once again by another round of performative acts of solidarity. Throughout the years, the city council has made many resolutions of solidarity against inequality, but nothing you say will mean anything if it's not followed by substantial, meaningful action. It is not enough to simply decry and condemn. Level funding is not defunding. If you co-sign a level funding budget, you are co-signing inaction in the face of inequality. You are co-signing a desire to do the absolute bare minimum, shifting the police budget increase out of PS in order to obtain level funding without one single police officer losing their job does absolutely zero to reduce policing in the community. We don't need less police vehicles. We need less police. You need to fire cops. It doesn't matter if they're good cops or bad cops, they're not needed. No matter how well reformed the Northampton Pipe PD might possibly be or may become, policing does not support a culture of civility. They do not make everyone feel safe walking down the street. Choosing not to defund does nothing to reduce police presence in the community, but it will show a distinct lack of vision and serve as another reminder that black lives don't matter. Level funding is not defunding and a decrease of $19,066 or literally a small fraction of a percent of the police budget is not defunding. Please stop making symbolic gestures. Please start listening to those without privilege. Please don't botch this. I yield my time. Thank you. Next is, it just says M. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, so I was assaulted by Northampton police last year. Um, I was discharged from Cooley Dickinson and realized that they never gave me my wallet. And when I returned to the emergency room to pick up my wallet, I was basically ambushed by police. Uh, wasn't suspected of a crime, was never charged with a crime, never found out who those officers were. Um, and every time I've tried to go looking into this, like who are these officers, how do I report this? The only mechanisms I can go through are basically the police department and Cooley Dickinson themselves, um, which I think you can obviously see why I wouldn't trust those groups to take care of this issue. Um, I've also seen cop cars almost hitting pedestrians um, on the street in Northampton. 
So I guess it's hard for me um, to see how the police are contributing to public safety. Also, when I was assaulted at Cooley Dickinson, um, yeah, I was thrown to the floor. Mm -hmm. I had marks on my face in front of a mother with her young child. Um, so yeah, I'm just not really seeing how Northampton police are actually contributing to public safety. And I think the very bare minimum would be those officers defund the police. Um, but obviously I don't think that goes far. Um, I have asked to unmute you again. I'm sorry, I have to ask for your name and your city or town. So if you'd be willing to unmute and tell us that it's for the public record and it's what I need to ask of you. Um, I'm not currently in Northampton. I'm in uh, in Colchester, Vermont, but uh, I'm a Smith student, so I'll be coming back to Northampton. Can you tell us your name? Okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, the next name is Daniel Canity. Daniel. Oh, there you go. It said that uh, I had to wait for you to unmute me. Okay. All right. Uh, so my name is Daniel Kennedy. I'm in Northampton, uh, Mass on South Street. I want to thank you for your time again tonight um, and say that I recognize the limits of what the council can do, but I urge you to pressure those who have control to make the changes that we as a community need. And for the mayor, I know you're on, and Chief Casper, if you're here, hear us. Over 6 million people have already seen John Oliver's segment on police accountability and got to watch as our cities made into a national joke as about 29 minutes. 29 minutes in, there's footage of an NPD officer repeating tone deaf statements about one bad hamburger. It's so much of a joke that John Oliver doesn't even, to make, doesn't even need a punchline to make it funny. The news about white nationalist affiliations of officers, especially high ranking officers involved in training and misconduct in our city, doesn't help that image either. And the testimony of everyone here sharing personal stories shows how much it's more than one bad hamburger. This isn't new, it's just the first time we feel like we might be heard. And I want to set this tone because the eyes of the nation are on this city. We're calling for changes that 30 to 40 years of research in sociology, economics, political science, criminal justice, law, and more all agree on. We know that police funding, increasing it, and bloated police budgets do not decrease crime. They increase it. That's not up for debate. It's a fact. We have the, we've seen that the biggest impact on crime reduction in the U.S. is community NGOs and social services spending. We need to defund the police. This is a process that happens over time, but it cannot be beginning with a less than 1% decrease of an operating budget. We need the police budget decreased and their responsibilities lessened and moved to other groups. Half measures will not work. Half measures will harm us. Reallocating not just funds, but responsibilities is important. And we know if you invest in our community, we will prosper. We keep hearing about the police budget needing to include contractual raises. It's being posed as there are only two choices, increasing the budget or massive layoffs. That's not enough, or that there's not enough time to make changes. But that's not true. Unions can negotiate in good faith and opt to share the pain of budget reductions. My own union asks for all members to have short furloughs and forego raises to ensure no one's laid off and police unions can do this as well. It's hard, but do not accept that there's only one path forward or only two choices. This is exactly what impact bargaining is for. Many have already said we need creative solutions. So vote no and encourage the mayor and the city to find creative solutions. I wanna say that even in the national backdrop of tension, we are local people calling for a local response. I sincerely hope that no one has to experience the trauma of being harassed, attacked, or belittled for their identity, or that they experience that trauma for years in their communities. And I very much hope that if they do, no one minimizes your reactions as irrational responses to something happening elsewhere. Every time we go through this as a nation or as a city, I have to reflect on each time I've had experiences with racism directly. When I've been harassed, attacked, called nigger, been told watermelon or fried chicken is on sale. It's calling up every time I've been followed by the police. Had officers call me boy, asked where I'm headed, had cops ask me who really owns my car and thought that I am one wrong word or action from being a corpse in the news. It's human to have an emotional reaction to that because it's frustrating that it happens here, that it happens all over the country and that for every 28 hours, it's fatal for someone who looks like me and I don't know if it's my turn. We can do better. Counselors, as you review these changes and future changes, please remember that our budget is a statement about our values. After listening to everyone motivated to speak out, I have to ask you, is this what you value? And can you push for meaningful, meaningful community creative solutions? 
yield the rest of my time. Thank you. That was the, that was the time. Um, thank you. Uh, okay, next is Robert Eastman. Hi, um, I'm Robert Eastman. I live on Orchard Street in Northampton in Ward 3A. And this is not directly related to the budget, uh, but it is relevant. I'm speaking to demand that the council make an ordinance that would allow for the creation of a community oversight board with legal power, one of the 10 demands put forth by the Black Lives Matter protest in Northampton this past Saturday, June 6. Currently, citizen complaints about illegal behavior of police are reviewed internally by the operations division commander, Captain Robert Powers, who is currently up for a raise in the currently proposed city budget. According to the police department's website, they are committed to providing law enforcement services that are fair, effective, and impartially applied. It is in the best interest of everyone that each complaint about the performance of an individual officer is resolved fairly and promptly. For those of you who don't know, Captain Robert Powers is currently the defendant in an ongoing civil rights case. The complaint against him alleges that Powers regularly used the term ethnics to interchangeably with Hispanics and that he told student officers that the Massachusetts police office officers should issue citations to ethnically altered vehicles all day long. The complaint also alleges that Captain Powers clearly expressed his pleasure that the class of student officers was not ethnically diverse because the entire class is made up of apparently white recruits. The case against Captain Robert uh, Powers asserts that the management at the academy openly fostered a culture of bullying and discrimination. Does this sound like someone fit to oversee the citizen complaint process put forth by the police department or someone who should be in charge of the hiring and promotion of police officers? Does it sound like a person who can uphold the department's commitment to providing law enforcement services that are fair, effective, and impartially applied? In case I'm not being clear, the answer is no. The only path forward to ensuring a fair and impartial judgment of citizen complaints against police is to to form a community oversight board with legal power. Police should not be deciding among themselves which complaints warrant an investigation. All citizen complaints should be automatically investigated by the community oversight board for the most fair and transparent outcome. Because the police benefit from legal doctrines such as qualified immunity, giving them an advantage in citizen complaint cases, police should not be included in the oversight board, which should have legal power in recommending disciplinary actions which the police department's website does not go into detail about or even mention that as a potential outcome. Many other towns and municipalities have community oversight boards, which could be used as models, including uh, in Eugene, Oregon, Dallas, Texas, and Boston, Massachusetts, to name a few. Citing the recent use of pepper spray and two teenagers in a uh, protest in Northampton and the numerous accounts of abuse of powers by police expressed during city council testimony over the past week, and today, it is beyond clear that we need a community oversight board instituted immediately. That and finally, I just want to echo uh, everything that's already been said and probably will be said that I support defunding and disbanding the police. Thank immediately. you. That's the time. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Um, I just want to note, even if you, you might not be able to see on here, but Mayor Narkowitz is um, on either on this call or watching and Chief Casper is also streaming and watching. Um, so they are listening. Uh, next is, I believe it's Nikki. Oh. Hi Nikki, are you there? I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, now, yes. Um, I'm Nicole LaRue, I live in East Hampton. I spend a lot of time and also money in Northampton. Think about it. In order for supremacist structures to continue to exist, people like you have made budget decisions like the one you are making tonight over and over and over. While some of the white people making decisions are obviously openly and proudly racist, many other white people have convinced themselves either that nothing is wrong or they have made a personal risk benefit calculation to uphold their own privilege and comfort by going along with things. It is not possible right now to uphold the idea that something is not wrong. Many people have spoken to that. Today, I want to speak to you instead about this personal interest calculation. I want to remind you that you have something morally at stake. Last week, I told you about my grandfather, a white high court judge in the apartheid era South Africa, 
a man who was literally known by people of color as a hanging judge for sentencing so many people to death, who lived his whole life confident that he was upholding an impartial system. In this COVID moment, while many POC in South Africa are literally starving to death, his wife continues to receive his full salary 20 years after he retired. Tell you that because it points to the absurdity of the original idea of giving raises to police right now. The night before he died, he pulled me over, my grandfather, and he took my hand and he said to me, I am not a lovable person. I feel years later that what he wanted was redemption for what he had done. This is relevant to the decisions that we are making right now, that you are making right now. As white people, we just keep thinking that systems will change one day and our actions don't matter or don't matter that much. The thing is that at the end of your lives, what you did in moments like this one will be what mattered. And your regret or your comments of, oh, I didn't know, they won't really matter. They won't matter for the black people who have been followed down our streets. They won't matter for the black children or their parents who are rightly scared. They won't matter for black people who are shot or suffocated to death with no consequence. They will not matter for their mothers or their brothers or their sisters or children or friends who have to stand in protest when they are grieving, left without their loved ones saying their names. Because the thing that matters here is not white regret after the fact. What matters is black lives. Black lives matter. When you make that risk benefit calculation that privileges your comfort, that you are, you are actually turning, remember that you are turning systemic violence into a personal decision about your comfort. We are your constituency. This is a democracy. These are our tax dollars. Speak up. This is not the time for your silence and we do not accept your silence. This is not the time for half measures and That's we do not accept this half measure. We are listening. Thank you for that comment. Okay. Next is four wins. <laughs> It's okay. Hello. Hello. My name is Jose. My family is from Puerto Rico. We es escaped the oppression um, and came here when I was a child. Um, I've seen firsthand the strategies of policing that America puts on other people and that America has nationally. I'm a resident of Northampton. I believe I'm in Ward 2A or 2 be I live in Hathaway Farms. Um, I've been on the phone almost every day with both state police, Chief Casper and Captain Powers. I can tell you right now that um, from what I've seen, these people don't have any credibility. Um, the things that they say um, aren't reflected in the actions of the, the unit. They, don't, they aren't reflected in anything that I see. I've been watching you people since I was a child. I came here because I know that you police white skinned people less than black skinned people. My mother taught me that. I came here from Holyoke where I grew up because I knew that I would have an easier time here tricking you into thinking that I was white. Um, and I, I observed how you treated my friends that were black um, here in town. And I've been here for 30 years. Uh, it doesn't really matter how the regime changes, the treatment is the same. My dark friends are in prison or have killed themselves because they've been over-policed. I almost killed myself five times from the ages of 19 to 22 because of the way that I grew up and the things that I saw. My mother would, did not lie to me about the things that I would experience. And she told me that I would have to behave for the cops even in Northampton or they would kill me. Um, with with joy um and i can tell you right now that i i have a family of seven here um i'm very happy we are all very happy my mother is a city councilor in holyoke she is also fighting the good fight and i can tell you from first hand that you that what you call police the color uh, the blood of the first people runs through my veins okay the blood of west africa runs through my veins and i'm also unfortunately the blood of colonizers runs through my veins as well because they raped the indigenous and enslaved my people. 
So I am here to tell you as the first people, as the enslaved and as the colonizer, that the thing that you're calling police, the thing that I've been watching, I hang out here for, uh, for a reason. And I still know that the police here, it's nothing but a white supremacist terror gang. Okay, that, that's what we're looking at. I, I've been on the phone, I asked, I can't believe there's a video of a state trooper with a dog. None of them have masks on. They keep saying they're all wearing masks. I look at them, no masks. All they do is lie to you, okay? Listen, the important part is, is they are racist. Look at the TV. That, that's, that's impossible to deny. If Captain Rogers is one of the worst racists that I've seen around here. And the things that he said is, are so unintelligent and shameful that I cannot believe that you have not forced him to resign. He is a stain on the department, and I cannot believe that someone that says the things that Chief Casper does, even though there's no follow-through, will tolerate a man like that to that's, stay in the department. That's the time. Thank you. There you go. Good luck, everyone. Okay. Next is Oriana R. Hello, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna try and make this as brief as possible. I'm just calling your attention to an email that was sent to you right before this meeting, so you probably haven't seen it yet. Um, Nine small businesses in Northampton have signed on in a, in, within less than eight hours today, they've signed on to this letter, supporting the 35% reduction in the police budget and urging the city council to reject the mayor's police budget for tonight and direct him to uh, redirect those funds into the social services that have been asked for. Um, those nine businesses are Dobra Tea, Hungry Ghost Bread, Cafe Evolution, Kestrel, Grapefruit, Haymarket Cafe, Lucky's Tattoo and Piercing on Main Street and separately on King Street, and Synergy Wearable Fashions. Um, so I just bring that to your attention, how wide the community support is, and if there had been even more time, I'm sure that list would be even longer. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Next is Mimi Odgers. Hello, um, I just have a very few brief remarks. Mimi Odgers, Ward 6. Um, the last meeting, there were some comments made by um, some citizens talking about how they feel protected by the police. Um, they're not, not recognizing the fact in their white privilege that they are, of course, they feel protected. I just want to point out that based on the Supreme Court, police are under no requirement to protect any of us unless we're in their custody. So I would like to direct you to understand that fact that in the cases of DeShaney versus Winnebago and the town of Castle Rock versus Gonzalez, Supreme Court has ruled that they are not in any way responsible for protecting any of us unless we're in their custody. So just keeping that in mind as all the other conversations that I've had, I think it's important because it's so easy to say they protect us. In fact, they're not required to protect us. Um, the second thing I just wanna say is that I am disheartened, disappointed by Mayor Narkowitz. I cannot get over his throwing of breadcrumbs trying to solve an issue that is so large. His uh, inability to actually connect with the fact of the pain that's happening and the understanding that maybe there's a really big problem with his police department. So I realize that the city councilors are getting a lot of the pressure put on them right now because you have to vote on this. But I would like to point out to all the people watching this thing that Mayor Narkowitz is the one who is unwilling to, to bounce. He said he, the, the amount of money he's doing is it's pathetic and it's insulting to every person who has been coming to these meetings and to every person who has been protesting. It's just an insult and it's a disappointment. And I hope that when we go into the next election cycle, we have somebody who will actually run against Mayor Narkowitz. And I hope that person um, does because I will be right in there in the first to, to help that person. And I, anyone who's out there who's thinking about running, please feel free to contact me. I will happily do it. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Uh, defund the police. Thank you.
thank you. Next is um, Bree Brianne. Um, hi, my name is Bree DeShanes. I live in Northampton. I'm in Ward 4. Um, within the national conversation that we are currently having about policing, which is obviously long overdue, um, our focus has rightfully been on how police in America disproportionately negatively affect communities of color. I would like to add a layer to that for your consideration. I work as a personal care attendant for a young man with disabilities. When we go into the community, I am always worried that he will do something, say something, that he will have sensory overload, something will happen, and someone will look at him and think that because he's different, he's a threat, and they will call the police, and that I will not be able to protect him. Um, there's a study that came out from the Rutterman Family Association like a year or two ago that says that a third to half of all people killed by police are disabled. I don't know if they also included in that um, various mental health issues, but that number is staggering, especially if you consider the intersection between race and class and disability. That's really important for our community to consider in terms of reallocating resources disproportionately sent to police that need to be distributed better amongst community NGOs, social services, and organizations that are better able to respond to situations involving all sorts of people. Um, someone talked about performative acts and the mayor offering to buy two instead of five police cars is a performative act. We are asking for more than that. We need you to take a really hard look at the policing budget and defund it, to take those resources and put them where they are most needed. Um, in the past, when the mayor has asked for things that our city has said no to, the city council has risen up and they have, for example, overridden his veto of, of surveillance technology. I'm asking you guys to really, really consider standing up and doing something similar, saying no, asking to really look into alternatives to the amount of money that we send to the police force that would be better spent serving our community in other ways. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Lois Ahrens. Hi. Hi. Try, okay. Um, my name is Lois Ahrens. I live in Ward 1. I've lived in Northampton for 40 years. Uh, before my other remarks, um, I want to ask if people are still required to wear masks. If they are, the police aren't doing it. Uh, yesterday, I saw two cops. One was on his phone, of course, but both were not wearing masks and they were standing on the corner of state and center ostensibly directing traffic of which there was almost none. Uh, traffic control is something people, not police could do and probably do more effectively. I once inquired how much training police get to do this. And the answer when I asked this, which was a few years ago, was five hours. This is one of the main functions of police, given uh, what little else they have to do. And I think most will agree that looking at their phone, talking to DPW workers, to each other, and to passersby is not what we're paying them to do. When there is actually traffic to direct, they are usually otherwise occupied. Um, now to the other subject of this hearing. Um, $19,000 out of $6.7 million for the police is barely a token change and in no way alters the unacceptable status quo, including the size of the police force, the huge expense of militarized equipment and high-tech police cars. I assume that when David Narkowitz listened to at least some of the testimony of hundreds of Northampton voters, he calculated, or maybe he hoped, 
He could do almost nothing and people would be satisfied. It is this kind of arrogance and this kind of lack of accountability that sets an example which, which trickles down to Jody Casper and then her example to the police force. If Northampton voters want a different kind of mayor, a mayor that will follow the example of other mayors in cities that actually have crime, then we need to have people who will step up and be candidates in the next election. And then we need to work to elect them. Mayors around the country are responding to their constituents who are demanding an end to bloated police forces and the kind of policing that uses armed police or paramilitary police, as we saw on Saturday, as the answer to every problem. Does Mayor Narkowitz's does um, Mayor Narkowitz's leadership and his budget reflect the thinking of Northampton voters? Is that what we want for four more years? I don't think so. The next election for mayor is September 2021, just over a year from now. This is the time for us to get to work. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Lucy Smith. Hello? Hello. So um, I would like to say for myself, uh, my name is Lucy Smith and I'm from uh, Northampton, Massachusetts and I work in Northampton, Massachusetts. Uh, I would like to say for myself that I think a community without police is possible, but in this comment, I'd like to meet some of my community where they are. Uh, the mayor has offered a paltry 0.28% budget cut and said it is going to be used to reduce or eliminate training of all things. Um, because the only other option in his mind is eliminating the planned transition of police vehicles to hybrid versions. This is a false choice to make us think that we can either be against the police or for the environment. But let's talk about those cars. Northampton has 34.2 square miles of land. Northampton PD has 15 cruisers, including a pickup truck. There are an undisclosed number of armored vehicles. That's at least one vehicle for every two miles, likely more. That would be 16 to 32 officers driving at once, depending on whether or not they're with a partner. Northampton PD has 52 employees and 37 officers or detectives who are the ones typically on patrols, traffic and parking duty, and responding to calls. The remaining employees are mostly hired ups who may need to drive to an occasional training, and there's no reason they can't do that in a personal vehicle. Um, but even if they do use a police vehicle for that purpose, they do not have a regular need. So 37 officers total is just barely over the 32 figure. We'll assume NOHO PD has at least a handful of unmarked vehicles for them. And that's assuming all 37 officers are in shift at the same time. With a regular eight hour shift, that's about 12 cops per shift. Even if each of them were riding slow though, that's at least four cop cars sitting unused that are, we are paying tens of thousands of dollars for the purchase of um, and some amount for the upkeep of. Um, 10 are sitting unused if cops are with a partner. In 2018, Northampton Police Department receives 38,703 calls. It sounds like a lot, but if you break it down, that's about four calls per hour, which remains pretty consistent from the data over the past five and 10 years. Let's say that these calls happened at the exact same time and took the entire hour, which is pretty unlikely, but let's say that with 12 cops on at a time and only four cops, that's four to eight cops, again, depending on partners, every hour, every shift, so 12 to 24 every day who are not responding to an urgent need of the community. They're waiting to pull someone over or otherwise waiting for a reason to do something. And that's dangerous. Bored cops are dangerous. They respond to other calls nearby where they are not need and escalate the situation. I've seen this happen firsthand dozens of times as I have practiced observing police actions as a white person in the past few years. In one incident in September, an officer threatened to confiscate my phone as evidence. He said this because he, and apparently none of the other two officers had their body cams on, which I'm sure we have paid quite a bit of money for. Uh, so mine was the only evidence. How terrifying is that? Um, and let's think about those calls that we're getting. Um, I looked at our major crime stats and um, I love this pace that we live in, but in terms of our crime stat, we are a podunk town. Um, we are probably one of the few places that has a major crime, most of our major crime stats in the single or double digits. And some might attribute that to policing, but uh, as we know from in 2014 with the NYPD um, taking a strike or slowdown of, or, of sorts, the crime stats went down. Um, time. That's the time, thank you. Okay, next is Dana Goldblatt.
Hi, my name is Dana Goldblatt, and uh, I'm a resident of Northampton. And uh, I want to talk about uh, Chief Casper's response when the community told her that they were unhappy with the militarized policing of our protest on Saturday. Uh, there were uh, what looked like a, just a troop of state police. They had an armored truck, which was related to the STOP program, which is supposed to be called out in cases of ter active terrorism or biological warfare. Um, there were, it was intimidating and it was unnecessary. And in response to being told that, first of all, her statement about the police was misleading. She said there would be a soft presence and also that it was in itself just substantively bad to do that. She's basically, her response by emails has been, well, that's how policing works. We had a big event and at the last one, there was some vandalism, so we called for backup. That's what happens, that's what policing is. And I just want the council to sit with that for a second. That's what policing is. And if you call her and tell her, I don't want you to do that, the response isn't, let's do something totally different. The response is, let me explain how this works. You can't stop it except by stopping policing. Now, one of the things that we hear a lot in Northampton is that our police are somehow different and better. Hopefully what Robert Powers did all over the country's television sets has eliminated that uh, fiction. But just in case it hasn't, I just wanna tell a story about what policing looks like in Northampton. This is when it goes well. So remember that uh, Officer Powers has the ability to identify ethnically altered vehicles. Now, what he means by that is that different cultures prefer different vehicles, different people have different needs. There's like, apparently, I didn't know this until I read that statement, a whole cottage industry of who you market to and which kind of cars different people buy. So yeah, it's possible to do this. You can watch a car go by and guess whether that person is black, white, or Hispanic. So he's been training people how to do that, which explains how people complain that black and brown people are stopped disproportionately on their way into Northampton. All the Northampton PD know how to do that. Thank you, Officer Powers. So I have a client who's Hispanic. He gets pulled over on his way in. Uh, the stop leads to uh, an arrest, which leads to ICE involvement. Now this should be okay because he's legal. He has a, a special status, but it turns out he, did, he missed an appointment to renew his status, which he didn't know he was supposed to go to because he'd moved. And because he got arrested and he has this charge pending, he can't renew the status now. And he got deported. And he has two children and a wife. He had a job. He's a regular guy. That's the time. That's what policing is. You stop it, please. Thank you. Next is Karen Miller. Hi, this is Lucien Baskin, uh, Ward 2. Uh, like many residents of Northampton and cities and towns across the nation, I support divesting from policing and investing in our community. I would like to see a greater investment in our public schools particularly in addressing growing inequality and housing for all. I would also like to rethink safety and how to meet the needs of survivors of domestic violence and people struggling with addiction and mental illness. I am deeply heartened to see our city council approaching this issue with such openness, listening to residents who shared their opinions and experiences for many hours last week. However, I do not think it is possible to do the work of defunding the Northampton Police Department and investing in our community without making significant cuts to the PS line in the budget. Yes, there are areas where decreases can be made elsewhere in the police budget. New police cars and guns come to mind. However, the vast majority of the police budget goes to personnel cost. 88.8% .8 of the department's $6.7 million budget, as well as a significant portion of the $20.5 million the city spends on benefits goes to paying police officers. This is due to two factors, the size of the force and the amount the department employees are paid. While I'm certain that cutting jobs is never a decision the city takes lightly, it is wrong to maintain a department of this size. The city's 72 person force, including 65 uniformed officers, is larger than departments in comparable sized cities, which average approximately 48 officers. 
Northampton faces the diminishing need for policing and of course the size we have, as crime is down by the police department's own reports. Additionally, work will be taken away from the department if the city transfers calls away from the police, as Eugene, Oregon has done with mental health first responders who take between 20 and 25% of emergency calls. Jody Casper claimed that police salaries were increased in the past to attract better officers to the department. However, Northampton pays its public school teachers among the lowest of any district in the state, 273rd out of 289 paying our teachers on average nearly $19,000 less than the average public school teacher in Massachusetts and nearly $21,000 less than the average police department employee in the city. If you get what you pay for, as Jody Casper argues, why then are we prioritizing hiring and retaining police officers and valuing their work, but not teachers? Parallels between how we as a city pay our teachers, most of whom are women, and our 86% male police force and the gendered wage gap are also growing. As we divest from policing, there will be a greater need for funding in social services, housing, and public health, among other parts of city government. In order to do this, the city council must take the step of decreasing the PS line in the police budget. In doing so, it is important to remember that this is allowing for funding to be diverted elsewhere in ways that will create new jobs in the city in fields such as in healthcare. Additionally, it is necessary to remember that we are facing a budget crisis, and this is not a singular targeting of the police department, but co comes co That is the time, Lucian. 17.25 .25 jobs in other departments. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next is Serafina Foreman. Hello. Um, hello, my name is Serafina Foreman and I'm from Northampton, MA. I would like to share a statement on behalf of Sunrise Northampton. Um, last, last summer, we called on the Northampton City Council to endorse our vision of the Green New Deal, which was a, sleet, a suite of policies. It was a resolution aiming to fight climate change and creating millions of good jobs in the process. Although our resolution passed unanimously, we feel that we need to remind you what the Green New Deal is and what it is not in this crucial moment in our history. The Green New Deal is a massive reinvestment in our communities to create a society that works for everyone. It is not the greenwashing of existing systems of exploitation and oppression. This is why we stand in solidarity with our community in calling for the defunding of the Northampton Police. And we wanted to and we wanted to call attention to two specific items in the amended budget. Um, actually, I'll just do one because of the time. Um, we take a firm stand against the green of the Northampton Police Department and denounce investments in the police force in next year's budget using the justification of climate change, including purchasing two hybrid vehicles. Surveillance and harassment of our community, especially our black and brown. Um, hey, Serafina, hold on, I'm stopping your time. You are, your, your sound is going in and out. If you turn off your video, it might improve it and we might be able to hear you better. Okay. Try. I was just talking about um, the, that surveillance and harassment of our community is from behind the wheel of the hybrid is still surveillance and harassment. The racist systems and institutions that treat black lives as disposable are the very same racist systems and institutions that treat our planet as disposable. If you're serious about bold climate action, instead of buying hybrid police cruisers, we challenge you to consider cutting the police's budget by at least 30, that 35%. That is what bold climate action looks like at the scale that science and justice demand. At Sunrise, we know that Green New Deal is about creating a world where we stop investing in, in violent policing and start investing in giving people what they need. We know we're on the right side of history. City Council, we ask you, which side are you on? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Next is Sakia. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Sakia Bishane. Uh, I live in Ward 3B. Um, you might, I have the first meeting I, I spoke about and I was assaulted by Officer Nicholas Limoges and Officer Kevin Cook. Um, and I'm here to, today to speak specifically to Jim Nash for a second. I believe you are my, my, my ward's 
representative. Um, one of my fellow people in my ward called you today and you said there was no time to rewrite the budget. This is the only time that you have. This is the only time that you have. You are going to defund the police or you are against the people. And if you are against the people, I don't, there's no place in this world for you anymore. Thank you, I yield my time. Thank you, John, hold on one sec. John Cohen is next. There, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Good, I'm John Cohen. I live in Ward 3A of Northampton. I want to second almost everything that's been said especially Serafina's remarks and Daniel Kennedy's remarks. And I, I want to say that we have to look at this moment as an opportunity, not an emotional reaction. It's a great opportunity. It's an opportunity to begin to build a new world. I know that sounds grandiose and rhetorical, but this is not rhetoric, this is practical. We have a moment now when there is tremendous interest and support for cutting the police budget and spreading that money out in constructive ways. A time where the residents can police themselves, where police can work always together with residents, where a citizens review board can have tremendous power, where racists and bigots will know enough not to even apply for a job, where community resources are taxes go to support health services, housing, senior citizens, education, the environment, et cetera, et cetera, not repression, not authoritarianism, which are threatening the very basis of our lives these days. This could be a world, a new world, where police cannot use tear gas without the specific approval of the city council, not the mayor. So, I want us to look at this as an opportunity, as a great opportunity. And I hope we'll take it that way and cut the police budget enormously and use that money to help people. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Danielle Amadeo. Hi there, yes, my name is Danielle Amadeo. I live in Ward 3 with Councilman Nash as our representative. Ditto to Daniel Kennedy, Dana Goldblatt, Mimi Audgers, Lucy Smith, yay for math. I don't think I've ever been so happy to hear statistics on a call. Thank you, Lucy. Ditto to Serafina and the Sunrise Movement and John, John Cohen. City councilors and Mr. Mayor, I know your jobs are really hard. Um, I think we've all gotten insight into how hard they are over the last uh, 20 something hours at this point of being on your calls. I also know you don't get paid very much and I think that sucks for the record, um, especially for the amount of hours that you're putting in. It's probably more hours than you signed up for or thought you were gonna have to put in and this, this sucks. Like you're not getting paid enough to do what you're doing. And I also really believe that you're all acting in accordance with what you think is best for our city. However, I'm on the call because I'm really disappointed. Um, Mr. Mayor and Councillor Nash, just because I voted for the two of you, you are really my, my reps on this. I'm so disappointed in you. I'm really, come, come on, I'm really disappointed in you. Um, your words in public statements and your actions show that you have not been listening and you have not started the work of unlearning. Your constituents are being extremely clear, extremely clear. And it, I mean, you should have been unlearning and you should have been listening over the past two weeks and you haven't been doing it. It is really clear by your statements that you haven't been doing it. And I need you to do better and we all need you to do better. It's not just about getting reelected in, in your next term, it's about serving your community. And, and I mean that you can do better. Can I get a thumbs up or a wave from anyone on this call that heard about this call because of the shoestring? 
anyone else here because of the shoestring? I think it's a disgrace and frankly unacceptable that the city council and the mayor is not doing more to open up transparency of these meetings. Why, is our, why are our activists and our journalists the ones that are making government accessible to us? We voted for you. You need to be the ones who are bringing government to us. I appreciate that a Zoom meeting is more accessible and I appreciate that this is happening because of COVID, but it should always be this way. Um, so thank you to our journalists. Thank you to our activists. Thank you to the folks who are doing the work out in the streets to educate, educate citizens and our leaders alike. Um, thank you for your vision and your leadership city councilors and Mr. Mayor, please take a lesson from your constituency. They have vision and they have leadership. Please follow their lead. Please be brave. Please defund the police. And um, I'm asking you to be creative and I'm really asking you to try a lot harder than I've seen you in the past two weeks. Thank you. Okay, next is Catherine Kay. That work. Yeah. You're unmuted. Okay, thanks. Um, my name is Catherine Kay. I live in Florence in Ward 5. I want Northampton to be a place where racial justice and equity and inclusion are bedrock values, and that those values translate into actual experience by everyone in the city. And I want the senseless violence that kills black and brown people to stop. This issue is so much bigger than the police. Defunding the Northampton Police Department will not achieve these goals. Would we defund schools because they need to do a better job educating our children? Of course not. We need to maintain uh, the, uh, our exceptional department. We all rely on the services provided by well-funded, well-trained, and well-equipped officers. I know my clients who are all, all victims of crime rely heavily on police departments to keep them safe from domestic violence, from sexual assault, and to respond when those crimes occur and to compassionately work with my clients to bring the perpetrators to justice. Importantly, our officers also protect our rights to march and assemble. They're the ones that clear the streets, that provide support to create the public square where we speak, even when that speech is directed at them. They prepare fully and carefully, and in doing so, they protect our peaceful protesters and us in the community in the event others who aren't the peaceful protesters decide to instigate violence. The Northampton Police Department is an essential ally, not the enemy. It's painful to listen to the repeated demonizing of police officers as though somehow they relinquish their humanity when they put on a uniform. No one who has actually had a conversation with Chief Casper can doubt her commitment to doing everything she can every day of the week to make this city a better place to live. Chief Casper and her officers take their work and their integrity seriously. I learned this firsthand when I attended the Citizens Police Academy a few years ago. I also think back to the work domestic violence advocates did with law enforcement agencies all across the region years ago to ra raise the awareness of issues related to domestic violence. When the work began, presentations to police were sometimes hard sells, but now, Knowing the officers were essential partners in achieving true change, the dialogue continued. Police officers are now some of the very strongest leaders in the community on these same issues. If we are to succeed in our battle for racial justice, we must build strong alliances with our, com uh, with our pub police officers individually and as departments. That is, that is the time. Let's make sure the NPD has the funding to continue to do this important work Thank with you. us. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Next is Gina Kim. Gina? Hello, yes. Um, I'm Gina Kim. Um, I'm a resident of Ward 2. 
Um, I'm a professor at Smith College and I've been an anti-racist educator for the past 10 years. And I'm here because I, like many of my comrades, want to speak in favor of defunding the Northampton police. Um, so first, I want to push against the common sense idea that policing is necessary to keep a community safe and against the idea that surveillance, policing, and punishment are obvious responses to harm or ways to prevent it. Um, police are not our caretakers or protectors. As the American past and present have made abundantly clear, they are in fact one of the largest forces causing harm in our nation. I also want to um, draw our attention to the fact that Historically, police departments have not been this well-funded or militarized, um, nor have they been considered the default response to a panoply of social issues. Um, this is a relatively recent development. Um, we saw the expansion of mass incarceration and the punitive arm of the state in the 70s and 80s, um, alongside the bleeding of the welfare state, public education, and social services. Um, the expansion of the punitive arm of the state, as many scholars have pointed out, has been a way of reproducing racialized and anti-Black state violence after the outlawing of, dis of legal discrimination and was and continues to be part of the ongoing conservative backlash to the acquisition of civil rights. I know we can do better. I have faith in our capacity to imagine and create a community that invests in actual care for its constituents. Um, I also want to point out that abolitionist and transformative justice scholars and activists have been doing this work for decades, and I am happy to point anyone towards these resources. I also want to push against the idea that police unions are equivalent to other unions or forms of organized labor, as police have been historically mobilized against the interests of the working classes and have been used to quell labor uprisings, punish poverty, and enforce austerity. As abolitionist scholars have pointed out, the extension of collective bargaining rights to, for instance, Florida sheriff's offices led to an estimated 40% increase in violent incidents among sheriff's offices that elected to unionize. A study using data from America's 100 largest cities found that extending police protections via union contract was positively correlated with the increased killing of unarmed members of the community. As a colleague of mine has pointed out, to invoke union contracts as a means of protecting police labor is what happens when you divorce a class analysis from a critical race analysis. And further, what does it mean to protect labor that is organized around brutalizing the black, brown, and low to no income members of our community? Thank you, that so, is the time. Thank you, I urge the city council members to defund the police. Thank you. Next is Jesse Hassinger. Hello. Um, four brief points. As the co-owner of Belly of the Beast, I would like to put on record that we are in support of defunding the, the police department uh, and would have signed the um, uh, uh, thing that Oriana <laughs> Riley spoke about. Um, I personally was able to sign it, but as a business, we were unable to sign in the time before it was submitted. Um, I just wanted that on the record. Also reflecting, I wanted to reflect the witnessing of police not wearing masks and being in physical contact with other citizens who are also not wearing masks. If the police are the education force that is supposed to be upholding the health department's mandates, they are failing on a daily basis. How can we assume that they are doing better in other parts of their jobs? The militarized presence at Saturday's peaceful protest was unwarranted and an enormous waste of money. The only damage that happened at the prior protest was two broken windows, some graffiti, and one person using their skateboard against an officer. While I don't condone violence, we have seen again and again that most of the violence during protests nationwide is started by plainclothes officers and anti-protesters. There is no reason why the added presence of six additional police departments, the state police, who, who Chief Casper says was necessary for crowd control, Amherst, East Hampton, Hadley, UMass Amherst Police Departments, as well as Hampshire County Sheriff's Office. 
even if the state police were thought of as warranted, there was no reason for these additional five other departments to be there. This was an enormous waste of taxpayer dollars. And as a taxpayer, I do not support this use of force against citizens, regardless of their threat level. Until we get a full defunding of the NPD in the interim, we must request that all officer worn cameras be used all of the time. There is no reason why this should not be the case. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Jake McGinsky. Yeah. I'm Jake McGinsky in Ward 3. Um, over the past week, uh, the police have proven once again that their real role in society is to contain and control those who threaten the status quo of white supremacy. Um, I'd like to use my time tonight to highlight the police response across the nation. I'm going to cut this a bit short. On May 31st, police shot the 20-year-old Texas State University student Justin Howell in the head with a lead pellet bag fired by an officer's shotgun. After he fell unconscious to the pavement, he was picked up by fellow protesters who tried to rush him past the police line for medical attention. The police then opened fire with another barrage. Powell was hospitalized in critical condition. In New York, NYPD has been charged with assault. An NYPD officer has been charged with assault, criminal mischief and harassment and menacing after a video showed him violently shoving a peaceful protester to the ground. In San Jose, police shot their own anti-bias trainer in the groin, rupturing his testicle with a rubber co coated bullet as he tried to de-escalate tension between police and protesters. I could go on and on, I'll end uh, with the fact that Northampton shamefully joined this list when officers fired pepper spray into an unarmed crowd from behind a closed door and two teenagers were directly hit, including a 15 year old. Imagine in Germany, if there was a direct lineage from the Gestapo to the present day police force. And if this were the case and Jews were killed, arrested and locked up at wildly disproportionate rates, while a culture of anti-Semitism was pervasive in the culture of the force, it took an international coalition to dissemble the racist and violent structures of Nazi Germany. And we have the opportunity to do this here now and peacefully. It's time to dismantle this linchpin of violence and structural injustice in our country and promote a vision of community health and well-being over one of control and containment. Northampton does not need to be patrolled. Be on the right side of, the his of history. Reject this budget. I know our community will figure out what to do next. I yield my time. Thank you. Next is Gillian. Hi, my name is Gillian. I am a resident of Northampton. Um, I echo much of what has been said except for the one person who is defending the police tonight. Um, among the hundreds who are um, urging you to continue to defund. I first have to say the mayor's new proposal was frankly offensive. Um, as others have said, the minuscule reduction in the proposed budget is, is an attempt to appease us. It's, a, it's an ignorant attempt to appease us. Um, and as others have said, it definitely speaks to the fact that he is in no way listening to what we are loudly, loudly saying. Six million dollars plus could build so much housing, support so much education, fund health systems, and provide food to hungry families in our town. There is just an endless list of where that money ought to be going. Um, and we really have to stop pretending that because this is Northampton, we are somehow better. We are somehow exempt from the problem of racism and other forms of oppression. Um, and that is to say, that is to speak directly to those of us who are white. Quite frankly, people like me have no right to say that the police are good. We are being told and we are seeing on a daily basis the violence they commit against people of color. And the idea of getting rid of the police department is such a revolutionary idea for so many of, of those sorts of people. Um, and as others have said, we are envisioning a new world and we have to do that. It's unrecognizable because violence against people of color has been ingrained in the fabric of this country from its founding. 
And if we dismantle the structures that support that, we are, we are imagining an entirely new country. Um, and that is something that we absolutely have to do. Um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color organizing are telling us that this is what we need to do and we have to just listen to them. White people do not listen to people of color as a general rule and that is what we have to do. Um, as a majority white town, um, that, is, that is our responsibility. And just to um, respond to the idea that officers do not relinquish their humanity, Anyone who supports, actively supports oppression and actively um, exists in a structure that is murdering black people and brown people, they have relinquished their humanity. They have made that choice. This is a profession, you put on a uniform, you can take it right off. And just to sort of hope that people can, can see the irony that police brutality has been the major response to protesting police brutality. This is all they know how to do. As others have said, this is what policing looks like. The police chief herself confirms that. Um, reforms to police departments have not worked. That is what people who've been doing this organizing for decades have told us. The only answer is to defund it and to move in the direction um, in a sustainable and, and logical way, moving money and resources where the community is telling us that it needs to go. Thank you. At, um, before you mute, could you um, could you state your full name for the record, please? Jillian Cannon. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Next is Kathleen Rose. Okay. Yes. Hi. Right, can you hear me? All right. Yes. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Kathleen Rose. I live in Northampton, Ward 1. So shout out to Michael Quinlan. I'm one of your constitu constituents. Please pay attention. Um, I am calling to voice basically the same thing as most of the other people have um, been saying, with one exception of um, Catherine Kay, who I have to say I vehemently <laughs> disagree with. Um, I, as a um, former victim of domestic violence, I have not found the Northampton Police Department particularly effective. In fact, when I had my ex-husband show up at my home on Mother's Day um, a few years ago, after having had a 25-year restraining order built into my divorce decree, um, but then dropping it after he left me alone for a few years, but it was still on court records, um, I called the police because he refused to leave. When the police showed up, um, I asked them to please go look for him. Because he refused to leave, I was pushing him away from my porch. Um, and ultimately, after he left, I was the one who ended up getting arrested by police um, because they said, someone has to be arrested today. He hadn't fought back, but it was my home. I asked him to leave. He refused to leave. He had, I had been a victim of domestic violence and had a restraining order for years. Um, he had a police record long as my arm. Um, but the police department literally said to me, someone has to be arrested today. I spent Mother's Day evening in jail. Um, and there have been so many other incidences. While I am so upset with the way Black people are treated and am feeling like Okay, again, Michael Quinlan, I live at Hampshire Heights. We are your constituents and we're pretty much all on the same page. Um, black people here have been treated abominably by the police department. Um, I recall one um, incident a few years ago when um, a black man was being dragged by his home by a mob of other people. So he pulled out a knife to protect himself. And then when the police arrived, all those people scattered like six different police people pulled uh, guns on this man. And even though the knife was pointed down and he was no threat to them, they were behaving like he was a complete threat, not seeing that this man was distraught, trying to protect himself. And the rest of us, um, including half white people, by the way, were all saying, don't shoot, don't shoot. Because their instinct was to shoot this man because he, had, he was holding a knife to protect himself. Um, so that's one thing. I have also had an experience in which um, I called the police on someone who I thought had started a fire, a person I was dating at the time. Um, 
and did an interview with um, Detective Michael Briggs. After that interview, more information came to light, and I- Sorry, that's the time. Could you finish oh. your story? Okay, basically, I am in complete agreement that the, the, the police department actually does more harm than good, and that Thanks. it needs to be completely revamped and re, re um, excuse me, um, ah, my, my words, um, basically take away the funding, defunded. Thank you. Thank you. G. Parker. That work? G. Parker. There you go. Yep. Hi, my name is Georgia Parker. I live in Ward 4 in Northampton. Uh, yeah, I just essentially want to echo what a lot of other people have said in this call, uh, calling for the counselors to defund the police. I 100% agree that they do more harm than good. Um, and I also believe that uh, the, the response to this has been in Mayor Narkowitz's um, readjusted budget uh, was truly disrespectful based off of uh, what the constituents of Northampton are saying uh, with regard to cutting the budget. Um, and also wanted to thank a lot of the other people who have spoken up tonight um, about their experience and also wanted to respond to some comments about um, police officers theoretically making uh, a community more safe for victims of sexual assault um, and other violence. So this study was put out by Black Lives Matter Chicago and states that only 23% of sexual assaults are reported uh, only 4.6% of perpetrators are arrested and less than 1% of rapists are incarcerated. Um, and with that, I just think that it speaks for itself in terms of what the police is actually here to do. It's not to protect us. Um, it is to uphold uh, these really dangerous um, and deadly systems um, that hurt others in our community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next is uh, Zachary Lounsbury. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Uh, okay. My name is Zach Lounsbury and I'm a resident of Northampton. Uh, my intention for speaking is to point out the charade of white supremacy that we're engaged with at this moment. I call this a charade because we are hiding behind the institutional processes of city council meetings and public comment when what is really happening is that we as people are debating, making comment on whether or not we believe black bodies and black lives have value. The fact that this is up for debate, that we can have opinions on this matter is evidence of the poorly mass white supremacist ideology behind this charade. Think for a moment of how sick we've become to be able to to be required to have this discussion. We have become so riddled with white supremacy and so bereft of humanity that we believe we can decide the value of others' lives. The value of black lives, ideas, contributions, requests, and demands should be self-evident. Yet here we are, here you are, discussing it and voting on it. Council members, you are not weighing in on a policy debate today. You are not voting to approve a budget. You are, not, you are making a choice. You are either upholding institutional white supremacy or you are not. The black voices from within our community, within our state and within our country have made it abundantly clear that the institution of police, including the Northampton Police Department, work actively to devalue and destroy their lives and communities. For those of you for whom testimony from black voices is not enough, the death and destruction caused by the police against black bodies and communities is made abundantly clear in the research literature. It is also clear police work for the destruction of immigrant, disabled, queer, and poor individuals and communities. Nonviolent workable alternatives are not only possible, but they are already happening. You are choosing to ignore them. You are choosing violence, choosing a profession that originates in the capture and destruction of black lives and continues in this purpose today. You are choosing anti-black racism, anti-black violence, and white supremacy. So let's be clear on what your vote means today. 
Either you affirm your role in the perpetuation of white supremacy or you don't. It is nothing more than that. Please do not say thank you. I am disturbed that I have to be here. I yield my time. Next is Emily Hunterwaddle. Hunterwaddle? It's Hunterwaddle. Um, I don't want to take up too much time, but I just wanted to appeal to you um, as humans with what I witnessed this weekend um, and what's been going on. Um, so this weekend at the peaceful protest, towards the end after a lot of people had gone, but there were still a lot of us, um, someone had a medical emergency um, and we were all like waiting for the ambulance. And I um, was standing on King Street, looking down towards Hotel Northampton. And we all saw the ambulance coming and we were waving our arms and we were really excited that this person was going to get help. And I watched as two police cars pulled out in front of the ambulance and turned it around. Um, Luckily, uh, our community and our protesters and organizers had set it up so we had trained medics on hand, which I think should point out the point we're trying to make that community based policies and I don't know, I don't know what I'm trying to say are better than the police who turned this ambulance around and like prevented it from coming to help this person by like 10 or 15 minutes. Um, beyond that, when I first showed up to the protest, I was walking, you know, past the road that has the parking garage and the courthouse. And I witnessed, um, you know, two big black vans um, where pe basically people dressed for desert storm were coming out, um, which was so shocking to me that I went and got photos, which I am emailing to all of you. So you will see a lot of documentation of all of um, the gear that they had. Um, but what was really disturbing to me was I then rounded the corner to try to go to the main part of the protest. And I saw that there was a mom nursing her baby, not like 20 yards away from like where Desert Storm was happening. Um, and I had to like warn that person. And that just feels like something that shouldn't be happening in our community. And I'm saying this and this experience because I feel like a lot of you are trying to say that it's not here and that like, not all cops and all that, but it is here. We like, we did witness this weekend, like emotional violence and then just like heinous things that the police were doing. Um, I also wanted to speak to Catherine Kay's point um, because she apparently represents domestic violence victims. My sister is a victim of domestic violence. Um, and she has always said that um, other than the actual domestic violence, the second worst thing about that happening to her was having to interface with the police because they didn't believe her. They made her question her own logic. They gaslit her and made her believe that it was her fault that she was being hit. Um, and in my own, I'm a, I'm a rape victim. And in my own experience with the police, it was exactly the same. They, um, tried to make me not believe in my own experience and tell me that it was my fault. And I'm actually currently being stalked by a Holyoke police officer um, who released my information to a white supremacist group. Um, and the thing about all the death threats that I'm currently getting is that um, when I go and look at the profile of these people, they're from this area. There is a big presence of white supremacists here, which I come from the South and so I didn't, I let my privilege blind me and I thought that it wasn't here, but it is here. They're here. I'm very sorry. That's the time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Annie. Hi. Um, my name is Annie Wood. Um, I'm a resident of Ward 3. Um, I heard at the last few hearings, several counselors sort of claimed that one of the reasons they couldn't defund the police department was out of solidarity with um, their union. And they sort of claimed that it was like their support for organized labor. Um, I'm a worker in domestic violence services actually. And I'm in the process of voting over joining um, UAW Local 2322, which put out a statement that I just wanted to read some of the demands from that I think are relevant here. Um, specifically, number one, 
the disaffiliation of unions representing police, immigrations and customs support enforcement, customs and border protection, and departments of corrections officers from the Western Mass Area Labor Federation and the AFL-CIO. Police unions enact and enable violence against black communities and communities of color. And for this reason, there can be no worker solidarity between survivors and perpetrators of police violence. And to the disarmament and defunding of local police departments with the redistribution of resources to democratically controlled education, healthcare, and housing infrastructure. Um, just to give people a sense of where some local unions, including ours, stand on this issue and how we feel about so-called police unions. Um, particularly for me, this feels really relevant and personal as a worker in domestic violence services. Um, hashtag don't represent the views of my employer. Um, <laughs> but I just like have seen so many instances of disrespect and racism and ableism from Northampton police to my clients. Um, and I think it's absurd to act like police help and support survivors. Also, to the woman that mentioned Michael Briggs earlier, I also had a really horrible experience with him, like, screaming at me about how he supports survivors while, like, detaining me. Um, and it was really traumatic and fucked up. So fuck that cop. Um, defund the police. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you. I'm going to remind people that um, there is no profanity. I understand there's a lot of passion behind what you're saying, but if more, it slips out more than once, I'm gonna have to mute you. Um, and if it's repeated, then we're gonna have to have a figure it out. Um, next is Sam. Does that work? Sam. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Sammy Cunningham. I live in Ward 3 in Northampton. Um, I wanted to, I spoke at the first uh, meeting, city council meeting, and I wanted to bring up a different point at this meeting. Um, I've worked for a Northampton homeless shelter for four years now. Previously before that, I worked with uh, a local residential for kids with emotional and behavioral struggles. Um, I'd like to respond to any statements ahead of time from City Hall that say a new crisis response team is too large a time or resource investment. Um, service providers have stated their needs for funding. Uh, Mayor Narkovitz invested in a panhandling group for months, a couple of months ago, to look into how to help our homeless community members. Um, at every crisis moment that I've had at the shelter, I have needed mental health professionals trained in de-escalation, and trauma-informed care, that has not happened. Um, and if they're really interested in helping the homeless population, we as service providers, we've seen what the needs are. And one of them is housing options for those struggling with addiction and those currently in recovery. Um, housing that has or works in conjunction with mental health support and coaching for folks who want to learn and practice life skills, including but not limited to, basic hygiene, work skills, to provide a sense of agency, or social and especially social emotional skills to handle life and build with their community, not as a separation from it, which I should think shelters contribute to. We need shelters with more caseworkers. Um, we have so many people with so many different needs. Um, we need trained people, we need funding for it, we need so much more funding. Um, and we need, we seriously need a non-police option for sectioning people who pose a significant risk to homeless others. We need to rethink sectioning completely. It's a very violent act that goes against consent and it doesn't work. Uh, we need to rethink it and having the police involved in a crisis, crisis, possibly psychotic break moment is incredibly traumatizing and does none of the work that psychology some, you hopefully hopes to do. Um, and so, and a reference to the panhandling group, I wanna say that homeless, if they wanna make it, a city hall wants it to make it apparent to the homeless community members um, that they want to support them and they care about them, they can reinvest in housing and local mental health services, especially crisis um, mobile, mobile services. And I just wanna say as somebody in the industry, service industries are more than prepared to follow up with the mayor about reallocating. Um, there will be time, just as there was time for this panhandling group. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, next is Elisa Klein. Hi, it's actually Amy Stam at um, in Leeds, Ward 7. And first off, I wanted to really thank, especially Rachel Maori, who's done a lot of really great work on this issue. And I just support your continued work as my city councilor. After 580 people attended the recent budget hearing, which was a record, 100 residents made public comments at the last city council meeting and 4,500 people, which is 15% of the population of Northampton, demonstrated to demand a significant reduction in the budget allocation to the police to dismantle the systemic racism that structures the department Mayor Narkowitz has responded by reducing the proposed police budget by 0.28%. In the same budget, the mayor has proposed to eliminate 17.25 full-time positions across the building, HRIT, public works, parking enforcement, senior services, treasurer, collector office, and the mayor's office. The US spends over $100 billion on policing and another $80 billion on incarceration annually. We as a city are part of a country that polices and incarcerates more people than the rest of the world combined, a rate that is shocking to people across the world. Yet the mayor has shown he is fine with continuing as is, even in the face of a national movement and a national reckoning. While residents of Northampton have demanded a 30% reduction in the police budget in a year that's ravaged the economic infrastructure of our city and the entire country, the mayor has come back with an offer of maintaining all police positions and funding of the department within 1% of its formerly proposed budget. This response pays lip service to a budget reduction with no intent to address the systemic racism at the heart of policing and no vision of how to take true anti-racist action. This moment where we've changed a million of our everyday behaviors as an entire country is unique in history. And I ask the city council to reject the mayor's proposed allocation to the police department and instead respond to your constituents who have overwhelmingly asked for a reimagination of our community. Listen to your constituents who have shared tes testimonials of how our local police have tracked, followed and harassed them who have shared ideas about reducing the role of police in areas of our civic functioning that should not contain a criminalizing element, who have proposed alternative visions of building our community together. We have a chance in this moment to unite with other cities and demonstrate that we can change our national and local habits of policing and oppressing the most vulnerable among us. Please follow your deepest ethics and stand on the right side of history. Thank you. Thank you. Amy, thank you. Next is Erica Roper. Erica. Hi. Hi. I hope you guys can hear me. I have a mask on because I'm out in public right now. We can hear you. Great. I just wanted to speak again as someone who has been a victim of Northampton police brutality because of my mental health. I'm also a victim of abuse from my partner. I'm no longer in that situation but I, was no long, I wasn't able to stay in Northampton. We need to change the way we think about serving our whole community. I am a privileged white woman, and this is how I was treated in that community. We need to radically change the way we think. If we don't wanna fire the Northampton Police Department, see how many of them stay when you take away their guns and call them a peace department. I yield my time. Thank you. Next is John Liebman. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'd like to address my comments to both the mayor and the council. 
We've listened to hundreds of Northampton residents testify over the last couple of weeks uh, in favor of a smaller police force and a radical rethinking of the role of police in our community. Thousands of residents demonstrated in the streets for these changes. In response, the mayor has proposed a budget which purports to reduce the police budget but fails to address the concerns of the community. We're not demanding buying less vehicles and deferring maintenance. We're demanding a reduction in the number of officers, an end to the use of police in all situations in which firearms are unnecessary, the demilitarization of the police force, and an end to racist law enforcement. The mayor and Chief Casper have failed to provide any justification for continuing with the current size and scope of the current department, particularly in light of the dire fiscal situation of the city residents and the city government and the uncontrolled COVID pandemic. The council should reject the budget, and demand a new one which reflects the will of the people. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Alice. Um, you're unmuted. Alice? Hello? Hi, hey, yeah. Hi. Um, so my full name is Chian Alice Ahn. Um, I'm a student at Smith College right now, so I spend most of my yearly time in Northampton and I rent an apartment uh, in the city. Um, First of all, I'd like to say that any activity that's attended to by police often becomes a question of criminality because of the place and status of police in this society. The fact that anything from disability to homelessness to discomfort is often given to the police to handle, whether it is for a minor reason or not, it becomes a question of treating that situation criminally because they are there. And it's de detrimental to the comfort and safety of marginalized groups, particularly for black and brown people. If we are if we are having questions of protection, I ask who gets to feel protected and to consider if those who are being targeted by police feel like they are being protected. If we are considering the question directly in relation to being taken into custody, then the people who are taken into custody should feel the safest and they are, as should be obvious now, do not. The fact that the safety uh, prioritized are the ones who are observing and those who are not being observed uh, and not those who are being observed should show the obvious flaws of this system and mentality. If people look through the budget as it exists now, the police budget sits at six million when health, for example, sits at a fraction of that budget at $500,000. For such an affluent city to spend money in this manner when there are people on the street and those same people talk about how shelters are overflowing during the winter is insulting and infuriating, especially in a pandemic. At a time of economic stress that is being most severely detrimental to those less privileged, when we're watching food lines pack up at food banks, to see so much money go to the police is emblematic of what the system's priorities really are, and it's not for the support of the people. A cut of a third from the police department would still leave it apparently at $4 million. In my opinion, the structure and societal place of the police will always make it a militarized, structured form of oppression, which cultivates that mentality. But in lieu of that, and in deference to the protesters on Saturday, who are faced with a direct example of this, a significant reduction of the budget, while those funds are redirected, redirected to boosting the support of the workers um, who work in de-escalation and individual help that have uh, been calling in all throughout uh, the course of this evening would be the least that could be done as well as continued and broader transparency of budget usage. Um, I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Next is Amy Bookbinder. You're unmuted, Amy. Okay, um, I'm in Ward 7 where I'm proud to say I was represented by Elisa Klein and also proud to say I'm now represented by Rachel Mayori. <clears throat> My name is Amy Goldstein Bookbinder, but I'm also Sandra Bland, George Floyd, Eric Gardner, and for purposes of this meeting, Jonas Correa and Eric Matlock. Which brings me to my first point. While I appreciate the words of concern from the mayor, police chief, and some counselors about systemic racing in racism in policing in the country, where is your concern about racist policing and excessive use of force right here in Northampton? The mayor, in his statement introducing his shameful budget uh, offer of reducing police funding by a mere 0.28% said out of respect and deference to both public and city concerns, 
Where is the mayor's concern? After person after person, hour after hour, shared stories about their abuse by our police officers. Where's his statement and Chief Casper's to the city in response to these stories with a commitment to hold those responsible accountable? Training hasn't and won't ever work in this city. Holding officers accountable might. Leaving the budget details to others, I'll just say this. With regard to police step increases, I have a labor background. I believe in living wages for all, but I don't think officers involved in racist and other forms of oppressive policing should receive wage increases or be kept on the force for that matter. Case in point, the officer who violently arrested Jonas Korea in 2013 requiring the city to settle a lawsuit for $52,500 was not fired or the case investigated, but instead was promoted by our current mayor to the number two position in the police department with a continuing step raise over the years to now $160,744. This is not okay nor do I believe it's okay for those harassing and using excessive force against Eric Matlock, another young man of color, to receive, to receive raises or remain on the police force. The Minneapolis police chief announced today he's cutting off negotiations with the police union there. I call on our mayor to do the same. Here's one reason why. When I asked the mayor a few years ago why he took down the black Lives Matter flag from City Hall. He said, because MLK's birthday month ended. I wondered, does he think Black Lives Matter only in January? I asked the city council to have the flag put back up. That request was ignored. I was told by several people after that, that the real reason he took it down was that the police union asked him to. I want the mayor and the police union to tell us if this is true. Either way, I call on the mayor and council to put that flag back up and disassociate from the police union. My final point, I call on the mayor to make a public apology to the brave public commenters last week, many of whom were first time commenters, who he mocked at the last budget hearing in a disgusting display of, to use his words, deference and respect the absence of which. And with my full respect for their courage and concerns as expressed, That's the time. I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you, that was the time. Um, next is the, uh, it's the phone number ending in 5171. Hi. Hi. So can you hear me? Yes, I think so. Okay. I'm just going to use the name Jane Doe. I am also a rape victim who had a very positive experience with the department. I've been listening to this all night and I'm sort of incredulous and shaking to my core at the disrespect that's been given to members of the department at the complete lack of awareness about what happens when the officers get it right. I am so sorry, Chief Casper and Mayor Narkowitz, that people are not talking about when they get it right. In 2014, I had to report it. It was one of the most difficult things I ever had to do. I had to have the courage to walk through the station. Having gone to Safe Passage, I had two choices, walk in through those doors and report it or leave the area. Those were my choices. And the sensitivity that I got from the officer, I will never, ever, ever forget. A year and a half ago, this is so d difficult and I cannot believe that people don't get this. Three little girls, <clears throat> in the Hilltop Apartments on Village Hill, 
had to witness their father kill their mother and then kill himself. And I wanna tell you who responded for those three little girls and the trauma that they experienced. It was the officer who took my report and the police dog who many people have said should be removed along with that officer because he volunteers in the schools. And I want to tell you, Chief Casper, I will never forget him. And I know what he did for those three little girls. He was the first person on the scene with that dog, Douglas. And you should all be ashamed of yourself because you have no idea what it's like when they get it right. Those little girls had lost both of their parents and what they faced, he knew, he was trained, he had expertise. I walked in the door having been raped. He knew things I had no idea about as a trauma survivor. The problem was not with him. It is not with him. It may be with the system, that follows, which has to do with the courts and what it means to testify. And for those little girls to grow up, now they need social services. That department deserves more money. He deserves a raise. Jody Casper deserves respect. The flag that needs to go up is a Blue Lives Matter flag. It's about the thin blue line. When this person who violated my restraint, when my restraining order was violated, it was the police that showed up. I'm sorry. Thank nobody you. there to pick, nobody picks up the phone and, and responds except thank them. Um, next up is Selena Della Croce. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. So I just want to say, I think that the last speaker is a really, you know, with all due respect, I think points to a really clear point that a lot of people here are speaking to, which is that people have incredibly different experiences with the police based on the color of your skin often and based on if you're poor or if you're not poor. And so I don't doubt that the police have showed up for certain people in certain ways. But I think that when you look at the institution of the police as a whole, there are over 400 participants on this call who have overwhelmingly been speaking to traumatic experiences with the police. They've been as domestic violence survivor, as survivors of domestic violence, as people who are poor, as people of color. The last time I spoke last week, I talked about an experience I witnessed where the police, I won't repeat my, the whole thing, but the police dragged a homeless man down the street on his back on the ice the second day I moved to Northampton um, over two years ago. So I think that um, we need to look at how we're spending our money as a community and think about the fact that um, about how many resources we put towards the police and if there are individual people who are adept at trauma um, trauma informed response those people should be incorporated into community mechanisms and we've seen ways that the community someone talked about the protest in Northampton on Saturday where protesters including an EMT you know, many actually like four or five EMTs who on their time off responded to that person. The community can come together and form responses to take care of each other despite the lack of funding. And I think that many people on this call have spent hours and hours and hours voicing our grievances to City Hall. Um, I should say I'm in Ward 5 with Alex Jarrett, who I campaigned for. Hi, Alex um, and Florence. Um, but many people have showed up out for hours and hours and hours over the past week to say the same thing over and over and over again, which is to defund the police. That doesn't mean come back and say, okay, we'll increase the funding, but we'll fund it less. With the amount of money that we're spending on riot gear, we could be spending on medical workers. I, last week, I talked about statistics of how, how many masks and how many N95s and how many surgical masks you can make by just buying one riot shield. We're in the middle of a global pandemic it's a crisis. We've never seen this many people unemployed almost in history. There are millions of new people. Last week it was um, 
1.8 million people filed for unemployment in one week. It's over 42 and a half million people, which is an old statistic who have filed for unemployment. And medical workers, I gave my partner who's an EMT something that looks like a neon sock to put on his head because they don't actually have protective gear as medical workers. So I think we need to think about our priorities as a society. And instead of funding the police, we should cut it with by cutting it by half. We should defund it, just to be clear. But by cutting it in half, we would free up $3.5 million that we could give to PPE for medical workers, housing for the poor, support for domestic violence survivors. And I urge you to consider those. I know my time is up. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm just going to note, so it's 6.55 now. We started at 11 minutes after five. So we'll be ending at 11 minutes after seven. Um, next is H. A. Hi, um, my name is Haley Arano. I'm a student who lives in Amherst. I just wanted to speak briefly about um, police police involvement in um, domestic violence services. Um, I think like prior to this call, no one who I know who has been a victim of, of sexual or domestic violence has ever had a positive experience with police. And I'm glad that the two people on this call who have had those experience did not continue to be re-traumatized by the police, which is what normally happens. However, those few experiences does not negate the fact that overwhelmingly it makes it worse for people and actually leads to people like not wanting to come forward and report assault. Um, my sister works for a rape crisis center in Philadelphia, PA. And now in addition to doing her usual work, which is like taking hotline calls, um, being a medical advocate and uh, and uh, showing people resources. She's also in so many meetings with statewide coalitions to find a way to limit police involvement in um, domestic violence resources and like and organizations because of how negative it's been for for survivors. Um, and so I just think it's important that the counselors know if they choose not to defund the police, they cannot claim that it is in solidarity with survivors. I yield my time. Thank you. Next is Bobby O. Bobby O. Unmuted. Yes, you are unmuted. Yes. Okay. I have questions um, that are, you know, there's so many of us that are brand new to this process, hundreds of us, obviously. Uh, and there's a lot of things that I'm not seeing shared during the calls that might be helpful. Just um, where do we get the transcripts and or recordings uh, of the city of the hearings, you know, the, for, for, for later reference? Um, it, is there anywhere where we can find one resource that has all of the applicable bylaws and rules that the city council has to operate under? Um, how is the police chief hired, selected and appointed and on whose authority? Uh, do we have access to the te actual text of the collective bargaining agreement, collective bargaining agreement that the NPD has uh, with the union? Uh, and if so, where can we find it uh, so that we can all look at it ourselves? This is the kind of thing that I feel like the council should be sharing with considering the kind of response that they've had rather than us have to work with each other to find. Um, does the department have records of complaints and disciplinary actions available to the public about members of the NPD? Can we actually find out who's had a force complaint, who's had other, you know, other complaints, who has had uh, in, uh, internal uh, uh, things, you know, internal uh, actions taken against them, uh, things like that? And can the MPD employees voluntarily reduce their salary, even though the collective bargaining agreement sets certain step raises? Because if you look at the amount that Mayor Narkowitz proposed this time around, it's like 0.028. Uh, if you look at just Chief Casper's salary alone, it's 0.025 of the entire police budget. So it's very close. It, it's interesting that, you know, as a leader, we didn't see her uh, try, voluntarily uh, reduce her own salary by $50,000 or something for a year to try and help out uh, to make football. So anyway, if there's any way you can get answers to those questions, because they're things that we need to be actively engaged. And I just don't know where to start to find that information. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Marlene Morocco. Marlene. Marlene. 
Marlene. Okay, Marlene, you're Marlene. unmuted. Uh oh. Marlene? Yep, we're here. <laughs> you're unmuted. Your I'm time started. So we're trying. Okay. Right, hang, on, hang on, hang on. You just we're need to talk. We can hear you. Yeah, we're here. We're trying to figure this out. We're here. <laughs> yep. Go ahead. Okay. Hi. We've got two machines oh, going good. on. Can you hear us? Yeah. You got a lot of feedback. Yep. Okay. Got, yeah, we're here. We're Turn off one okay, of your right. things. This is Susan McGuire, actually, and with Marlene, and I am with my wife, Marlene Morocco. And we, there are so many comments that have been said tonight that are really distressing. That back on that are quite distressing to me. <sighs> chief Jody Casper was one of the first chiefs of a police department that uh, signed on to the open data, and she oh, is no, as progressive. And I personally have worked with Northampton Police, I have seen the compassion and the and and the, the what they have given to this community they are trained to work with people that are mentally ill this goes back before even chief chief casper to chief sinkowitz that has worked with the mentally ill in this town that has worked with children and my work on the children's advocacy center i have seen the detectives do beyond the amount of work to try to help victims of sexual abuse, victims of physical abuse and domestic violence to help these children. I absolutely would ask people to not paint a broad brush of Northampton, of any police department there are a few heinous individuals that have created that started this protest and i support them but i would ask the council and the mayor to really look at this budget and to understand that this is about raises well deserved the prior speaker was talking about taking cuts in salary these people work 24 seven, they are tireless in what they do. And I would really ask the mayor and the council to not look at this defunding. This is about some hybrid vehicles. We still have climate change to look at. There is so much that is just not identified that these, this police department does on a daily basis. And I truly wish that people would look on the website and see the transparency. I have personally worked with this Northampton Police Department. That, um, and I know that, is, that they work hard thank and you. they share and they have compassion. That, that's time. Thank you so much. Uh, next is Chelsea. Um, Villarreal, maybe? Thank you. Oh. Hello. Hi. Hi, my name is Nicole Chakis, and I live in Ward 4. And um, I want to speak to something that I haven't heard others speak um, in detail about, but have, <laughs> I think, mentioned. And that is <laughs> that um, the gross earnings of our police department and the 65 members in it and that being, um, I just looked at the 2019 um, gross earnings list um, of Northampton, and there are 22 members of the police department that earn over $100,000 a year. Um, there are 11 that earn between 90,000 and 100,000. There are nine that earn between 80,000 and 90,000. There are nine that earn between 70,000 and 80,000. That's 51 members of our police department making more than the median income of Northampton in, I have the figure from 2018, 2018 which was $64,850. Um, that seems very disproportionate in my opinion, um, especially when 
what you find on the police department website is that patrol officer salaries range between 48,588 and 66,221. Yet that only, I assume, makes up around 14 people in the department. Um, so I think that they're making um, a huge amount of the people that work at the police department are making much more than a lot of people in Northampton. And in the current climate, um, not only the racial injustices that are going on, but especially with a global pandemic going on, they do not need step increases this year. Um, and frankly, I find it offensive that they would strike the um, training budget of nearly $8,000 before stopping or eliminating these increases in salaries for a single year. Um, I know that people are calling for more of a budget cut, um, which I agree with, but we got to start somewhere. And I think not doing the step increases this year is the least that the police department can do um, for our community right now. Um, and I'd like to point out that the top two earners in the police department are Lieutenant Alan Borowski, who makes $160,145 this year. Um, who also gets a step increase, and uh, Police Chief Jody Casper, who makes $147,330. Those are unbelievably high numbers, um, and they, at the very least, should decline taking those increases, especially when Jody Casper couldn't give us our time when she said that community conversation uh, wasn't happening and that we didn't want to listen. But she clearly didn't want to listen to us when she left the meeting last week that is the time before we all got to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Mark Guillermo. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Um, I come from a family, I have three uncles who were police officers. So I grew up with them, I love them. Um, it doesn't cloud my ability to see what policing has become in this country, what it started out as, as I heard someone else say, and what it still is. And what really disturbs me about the mayor not reacting and not responding to this historic moment, we are in an historic moment. You guys are the only ones who can check this white male mayor. And I, I'm offended that that guy would look at the budget and look at the streets. I've never seen that many people on the streets in our town, I'm in Ward 3, I've been here 13 years, come out and say, listen, we do not feel safer with the police here. The police, po policing, it's been 50 years since we had a good hard look at policing in this country. And how many people have been killed since then? How many people of color have been killed since then? You know, and we have this 88% white community. I'm honestly scared when I invite my Latino and black friends to this community. I just think that if you guys aren't going to stand up and listen to us, you represent us. We are saying unequivocally, almost every person who's talked tonight is saying, we need other solutions to the problems we have in our community. There are so many issues in our community. We have poor people living in our community who aren't getting good services. You know, the Latino community and the two public housing projects, I, I work in there, I go in there and I see they don't have access to the things that they need. And yet we're paying these police officers inordinate amounts of money. I mean, I work for Young and Hard Chorus. We have to raise every penny of my own salary I have to raise. And we do great work in this community, you know, but we got to raise every dime we spend. Meanwhile, these cops, some of whom are good, Many of whom are racist, as, as are most of, I'm, I'm, white, I'm a white male. I was brainwashed from an early age in this system, in schools, from the books, et cetera. And I'm just, uh, the fact that Mayor Narkowitz is not listening to the people of this town and responding to this historic moment leads me to believe that you guys who are voting on this budget, who, who can keep him honest, have to stand up and represent us. And I, and, I, and I hope that you guys do. And I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, Tara. Hey, 
Hey there, I'm uh, not Tara, I'm Jeffrey. I live in Greenfield. Um, I recently moved out of Northampton though. Um, I wanted to respond really quick to someone who spoke a minute ago um, about painting cups with a broad brush. Um, and I think the thing that makes it easy to paint cups, the police force with a broad brush is the fact that the police were established to do one thing and one thing only, and that is to protect the private property of the ruling class and the tools that they have to do that are violence and incarceration. Um, and I think as a community, there aren't that many of us that would be in support of violence and incarceration. Um, I also wanna talk about what's happening in Minneapolis right now. Um, and the fact that the city council of Minneapolis, which is a much larger city than Northampton, just this week committed to begin the process of defunding the Minneapolis police. And the reason that they came to that conclusion is because the Minneapolis police is one of the most, for lack of a better word, progressive police departments in the country. They've been through every possible round of reforms that a police department could go through and they are still out there every day terrorizing black and brown communities. Um, so if the city council of Minneapolis can commit to that kind of radical action, um, it's, it's wild to me that the city council of Northampton cannot commit to that kind of thing. Um, and I think it's great that we're talking about defunding the police, but I think it's become clear in situations like with Minneapolis, that defunding the police is only the first step. Defunding the police is the lowest possible bar. And the only thing that's going to keep our city safe, that's going to keep these communities safe, is complete abolition of the police. Nothing less than complete abolition is what is going to actually protect people. I yield the rest of my time. Um, I need to ask for your last name, please, for the record. Hune. Thank you. OK. It is 7.12, um, and I said we were ending at 7.11. Uh, um, I, I, I know that there are some hands left. There are many more hands than would take a couple minutes. Um, I'm gonna remind everybody that we have um, another meeting, so we will presumably be taking the second vote on the budget at our next council meeting, which is, uh, June 18th, so that's next Thursday. Um, and there will be public, public comment at that as well. Um, but we are going to convene the meeting um, and get to the item that's on the agenda, which is what you all want us to talk about. So um, Laura, when you are, uh, sorry, um, the meeting is seven o'clock on Thursday, um, the 18th. Uh, Laura, when you are ready, please take the roll. Sure. Councillor Dwight. Oh, hold on. <laughs> okay, let me find all of them. <laughs> Wait. Uh, I know you guys have all taught me this trick. Still, everything gets rejumbled. I need to give me a sec. Okay. Uh, there he is. I am going to ask again, um, if you can please turn off your video, that'll make it much easier for people to see the council. Okay, go ahead, okay. Laura. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Foster. Here. Councilor Jarrett. Here. Councilor Labarge. Councillor Mayori. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor Quinlan. Here. Councillor Quinlan, was that a here? Yeah, here. Okay. Councillor Shara. Here. And Councillor Thorpe. Here. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Okay, thank you. So we are gonna convene this meeting which has one item on the agenda. Um, I wanna recognize again that for 
for many, most of us, this is new, um, this whole process. You haven't experienced this process before. Most of the counselors haven't gone through this budget process before, and this is their, their first time doing it. Um, I'm gonna quickly answer uh, the question that was just recently asked, which is under our ju jurisdiction. As I have said at the start of every meeting, the video for these meetings are always posted and quite quickly on Northampton Open Media's government video archive channel. It's on their YouTube channel, look for government video archive. Um, they always post these, all of our meetings, they record our meetings. We're so grateful for them and for providing that access. Um, our rules and the city charter are available on the Northampton website. So northamptonma.gov for the city council rules, you go to the city council page, they're on our page. The charter is under, um, Charter and code. So that's where you can find that information. Um, so thank you again. This is all, you know, this has been a long process. It still is a long process. It's been a very unusual process, both in, in having any public participation, <laughs> um, not to mention all of this participation, um, but also in the, these unusual extra procedural steps we need to take and you're gonna watch us take again. Um, we're thrilled to have everyone part of this process. It's what we've always pleaded for. But it is a process, it can be long and detailed and messy and is not always of intense personal interest to everyone. So I, uh, I get why that's frustrating, but this is what our job is. So let's get started. The item on the agenda is the order to approve the FY 2021 general fund budget. This is a continuation of what was on the floor when we voted to continue after 2 a.m. last week. But as you know, that order 20.053 was withdrawn by the mayor and replaced by a new order. So what that does is it wipes the slate and we start over essentially from the beginning. So I've got my flow chart up again. We are going to start from step one of that five step process for um, Councillor Jarrett's conflict of interest and um, I'm gonna unmute Councilor Jarrett if he's not, if he's muted at the moment um, and ask if he wants to disclose it again and then he will remove himself, himself for step one and step two. Thank you, Council President. Um, so I have a conflict of interest because there is one item on this agenda. Uh, it is a contract that my business, the Pedal People Cooperative, has with the city a pre-existing contract from before I was elected. Um, so uh, thank you for doing these, pro these this process in order that I may participate in the majority of the general fund discussion. So I will stop my video, which is the uh, equivalent of uh, stepping away. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Councilor Mayori, I saw a hand. Mm -hmm. You have a question? Yes, I wanted to make a motion for a five minute recess. Oh, yes. Uh, motions for recess are always um, acknowledged or accepted. And so we will um, take a five minute recess and then we will come back. Thank you. Okay, we are back from recess. Um, so where we were, so we're in, as I said, we're in step one of this process. This is where I'm gonna need you guys to work with me. So, um, so step one is to, um, we're gonna, I need a motion to put adoption of the FY 2021 general fund budget on the floor for discussion. This is not the order, but this is a motion to adopt it. I'll make the motion. Wait, uh, motion was uh, made. Point of, yep. point of order. Yes. Um, shouldn't the first item be uh, the removal or the withdrawal yep. of uh, twenty point zero five three? No. Do not mess with my <laughs> chart. No. All right. All right. Then I will second the adoption. Then. Okay. Okay. So. The motion is on the floor to adopt the 2021 general fund budget. Um, now, um, 
I will ask if there's discussion on this, but we need to get to the next step. Hearing none, step two, I need a motion to divide the question to separately consider the $38,000 line item in the central services parking maintenance budget for the pedal people contract. Uh, Councilor right. Tight. I move that we separate the $38,000 line item in um, central services contract, representing parking central services parking maintenance contract with pedal people. Okay, so the motion, I'm gonna, I'm gonna restate what that motion is. The motion is to separate um, and separately consider the $38,000 line item in the central services parking maintenance budget for the pedal people contract. Is there a second? A second half. Second. Okay, it's been seconded by Councillor Labarge. Okay, so now um, is there discussion on removing or separating that line item. Okay, hearing none, so that's a subsidiary motion. Hearing none, roll call please on separating the question. Okay. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Foster. Yes. Councillor Jarrett. Oh recused himself. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Maori. Oh, hold on. Whoops. Got it? Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. And Councillor Thorpe. Yes. Okay. So we have now separated out that line item. I am going to ask Councillor Jarrett to come back. This is step three. Oh, and there he is. Are you able to unmute yourself? Let me check. Nope, hold on one sec. Okay, you should be able to do that now. Okay. Um, okay, so this so what is what hold on give me a sec give me a sec okay step three i need a motion to adopt the fy 2021 general fund budget with the thirty eight thousand dollar line item removed so the budget minus that line item make the motion Motion's been made by Councillor Maori. Second. Seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Correct. Point of order. Yes. Um, in each of these instances, we have not identified the item by its uh, catalog number. And does that going to make a difference? I'm very, I'm aware. This is not the order. As I said, this okay. is not the order. This is a All motion right. to adopt the FY 2021 general fund budget. The order Councilor, is step five. Yes, Laura. Councilor Shara, I yeah. believed that once um, the order, the whole budget, the order, I'm sorry, the FY 2021 budget was put on the floor and then the $38,000 was removed. So I believe that the FY 2021 budget is on the floor for discussion now and doesn't need a separate motion to approve it. And that was the previous, the, the standing motion that I thought now is just the consideration and vote on it. And please, Attorney Seawald, correct me if I. All right, I'm going to find Attorney Seawald. That is my understanding is that we start this process from the beginning. Um, where are you? There you are. Okay. Hello, everyone. Let Hello. me. Uh... I lost my Zoom screen. So um, yes, you're starting from the beginning. You're doing exactly as you uh, as you did uh, before. Um, I missed whether you actually uh, the. I don't think that you would have. 
we're we're not you're not coming in too clearly put the budget no fund budget on the floor i'm sorry unless that was done um as part of the initial um motion so, so i'd have to look back at the yeah. motion to see whether the general fund budget is on the floor okay um can you um can you turn off your video i think that'll help because we're having trouble hearing you you're sort of freezing um can you hear me now yes i think yes people hear me yeah I'd have to look back at the motion that was made initially to see whether the general fund budget is now on the floor. Um, mm -hmm. Laura, is that what happened? May I summarize the motions made? Yes, the, yes. the initial motion was to adopt the FY 2021 general fund budget. Then a motion was made to divide the question to separately consider the $38,000 and that passed. So I believe now <laughs> it's on the floor without the need to Right. Make You're back to the main motion, which is the general fund budget now oh, okay. with the uh, the amount for the contract removed. Okay. So we are in that that um, main motion to adopt, which is not the order minus the removal. Got it. Okay. We may need the motion maker to withdraw the motion that was made to. Oh. Um, to adopt the second motion to adopt the FY 2021 budget. Perhaps. I removed I removed the motion for consideration. Thank you. Okay. It's been withdrawn by Councillor Maori and who is the second Councillor Thorpe? <clears throat> yeah? Yes. Okay. okay. Great. Okay. So we are back where we were, but with the new budget there. Since um, since this is a this is a new budget um, and we've started from the beginning, I'm going to ask Mayor Narkowitz if he wants to in introduce his budget again minus the removed item. Uh, thank you, Council President, and members of the City Council, and members of the public that are watching. Um, so this is a um, a revised order, uh, specifically just the order to approve the FY 2021 uh, general uh, fund budget, which uh, was part of the package of orders that are part of my 2021 operating budget. Um, obviously, I've uh, uh, attended and followed very closely the two nights, now three nights of, um, of hearings on the budget and comments about the budget and, um, and followed your debate on it and answered questions during it. Um, and essentially the uh, an original proposal was um, a, a $193,579 uh, level service increase to that budget um, with sort of that spread out across the three uh, uh, areas of the budget uh, in PS, in OM, and in OM. OOM. Um, and so in your when you last left off at uh, 2 or 3 a.m. Um, on Friday morning last week, um, there had been a motion on the floor that had been seconded um, that would have just basically reduced that, eliminated that $193,579 increase uh, to the Northampton Police Department budget. Um, and it felt to me like there was consensus um, on the council to do that. Uh, but there was some discussion, and I think that's where things um, got continued about whether um, you know that approach uh, or what was being proposed was the clearest way to do that, um, and whether there were alternatives. Um, you know, my my attempt here was to um, first of all acknowledge all of the concern in the community about an increase to the police budget at this time as well as the concern that counselors had, um, I think, almost unanimously expressed uh, about having an increase at this time. Um, so I withdrew under your rules um, and have submitted a revised order um, and essentially um, uh, tried to come up with a, um, an order that uh, 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 you know, uh, eliminated any kind of an increase um, I was not able to make it come to exactly 193,579, um, given the way it was structured. 
Um, but essentially, uh, it maintains the uh, PS increase of 140.042 um, to honor our legally binding collective bargaining agreements, uh, which is consistent with all of our other city and school department budgets. Um, it, it, like your prior motion, um, eliminates the increase to the OM line item of 8,072. Um, and then instead of um, just eliminating the 45,465 uh, that had been proposed in the OMM line, uh, which was basically to cover the increased costs um, of changing our annual replacement of our five cruisers um, to a replacement of five hybrid cruisers, um, but then actually cutting that line um, significantly um, and reducing it down from a proposed 358.25 to 146.262. Uh, um, and that effectively means that there would not be a replacement of the five cruisers, that it would be um, only two uh, that would be replaced. Um, so that is the substance of what I proposed. Um, uh, and obviously, um, I was uh, trying to respond to what I was hearing from the council and what I was hearing from the public about uh, uh, being opposed to any kind of increase uh, to the budget at this time. Um, and, you know, as I wrote to you in my message, um, I understand uh, that uh, since I submitted this budget uh, back on May 18th, uh, we are in a different place. And, um, and I share the concern and the outrage that the public has expressed and that we're seeing all across the country about the issues that were raised, um, you know, by the killing, uh, tragic killing and murder, frankly, of George Floyd. Um, I issued a statement myself about it um, back on June 1st. Um, and I wanna work with the city council to address these issues, including um, how we do policing uh, going forward um, as a, not only as a community, but as a, as a nation. And so I'm committed to that and I wanna work with the city council on that. But my purpose um, in this um, revised order um, was to try to achieve uh, what I think the council was, was working toward um, last Friday, which was to eliminate any kind of an increase uh, to the budget for FY 2021. So the net result of it is it actually um, goes a little bit beyond um, eliminating the increase um, to 212, 645, which results in a slight decrease. But again, my goal was to um, eliminate the increase. Um, I've reached out to the council president and indicated that I want to uh, sit down with her and, and think about and you know, come up with a process, come up with how we will um, start to take all of this information that we've received from the public, all of the ideas, all of the concerns, um, what sort of a, you know, is it, is it a, um, a committee that represents uh, a diverse uh, cross-section of our community to really study these issues. Those of you who have worked with me know that I am somebody who is uh, very committed to um, when, when we have you know, issues or problems facing our community, um, that I'm somebody who takes a very serious, planful approach. Um, and that involves sometimes doing studies, uh, deep dives into the issues, pulling together uh, groups, people uh, to help with that work and to give us advice as a city government. Um, and I, that would be the approach I would want to uh, take in this matter. Um, and I want to work with the city council to come up with a process for how we could do that. So we could work together as a unified city government to address these serious issues that we, um, that we see um, and that we hear about from our community. So uh, that's the purpose of the order. That's what's behind um, this revised order. Um, and I sort of resubmit it to you um, to, um, for your consideration and obviously to answer questions that you may have about it. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Jarrett. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a question about, um, you know, we have a declining crime rate, which is great. Um, and we have a force size that is larger than most towns of our size. Um, I've heard, you know, several people in comment and I did some research as well. Um, so about 50 officers would be about average for uh, this town size. Um, can you explain why we have a force that is larger than that? 
Um, certainly, Counselor, thank you. So, you know, we've done a lot of analysis of our, um, of our, of our uh, police department over time, including um, when we were looking at uh, building the new police station uh, several years ago and sort of looking out to the future. I think one of the things that makes us a little bit different from communities that are a similar size to Northampton is the, um, is the incredible amount of visitorship that we have as a community. Like our downtown is a major uh, draw. Uh, we have obviously concert venues and restaurants and art galleries and all of those kinds of things that bring a lot of people into our community. Um, so, well, we're, uh, you know, obviously not during the pandemic, but, um, but essentially, you know, on a, on a weekend in Northampton, um, we sort of present as a much bigger city in terms of the amount of visitors and activity. And if you look at some of the data around, um, you know, around, you know, motor vehicle accidents um, that occur, um, the, a high number of them um, actually occur among people that don't live in Northampton that we respond to, but that happen in our city that we have to respond to. Um, and so, um, so that's really why uh, the force uh, in terms of the size of the force um, is what it is. I would say that it has not changed dramatically, um, but in terms of call volume and, um, and, the, and the amount of, again, uh, the size of the city in terms of all the folks, including some of the folks we've heard from tonight who may not live in Northampton, but work in Northampton um, and have an affinity for Northampton and, and you know, may come here on a weekend. Um, so that's sort of the, the background. And, you know, there was a, um, you know, there was a, a, a study that was done back during the time when we were looking at the police station because we were trying to understand um, how we uh, you know, what size we should be building the police station for understanding what our force might look at like in the future. Um, you know, I don't know what communities that you're comparing with. I'm not sure like Amherst, for example, if you're looking at Amherst, I mean, Amherst also has the benefit of a separate state police agency, the UMass police force, um, which is basically policing, you know, a large, you know, 30,000, uh, uh, population there as well. So I, again, I'd have to understand what the comparisons were, um, but that's the basis for where we are in terms of our staffing levels. The chief could probably speak to it um, in more detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I was looking at national averages um, so that I didn't compare it to, you know, places around here in particular that I'd be interested in doing that. And then the issue of the major um, declining crime rate um, what and would so would there be you know would you see okay the the crime rate keeps declining do we do reduce the size of the force or is that not how i mean could you ex explain how that factors in so certainly major crimes have been have been going down nationwide you know that's a that's been a trend and that's happening you know even in places like you know new york city we've had we've seen drops in major crimes um you know and so which is obviously a positive thing and those are uh the ones that are you know cataloged i believe by you know the fbi with certain categories that they track um but i think that doesn't account for the fact that we still get uh you know we still receive um uh many, many, many uh, calls for service for, for our police department. Um, they may not be, they may not be responding to major crimes, but now we've seen um, them, re them responding to other issues. Um, you know, I think about uh, the way the opioid crisis has affected um, our community and communities across the nation. And the fact that now, um, you know, uh, police officers um, are being called to those types of calls that may not have been a factor um, you know, 10 years ago. Um, and then all the other related um, calls that don't count as major crimes, um, but that are still part of what, um, you know, it's, it's sort of part of the conversation we've heard in, um, in, in the public comment about, um, you know, are police the most appropriate to be responding um, to, you know, as, as drug interventionists or to mental health crisis calls, et cetera. I think those are very valid points and those are things we should be looking at. Somebody mentioned in the public comment um, section about the study that uh, the work group that we had that looked at um, 
you know, at-risk individuals and panhandling um, and came up with a series of recommendations and we're already working on some of them like the Resilience Hub, but one of them was, you know, a crisis intervention team. So I think there's, um, and that is definitely an, I, that is definitely an, uh, a concept where we try to move away from um, having police respond to those kinds of things. Um, but until we have that structure in place, until we figure out what that structure is, and we talk about what that transition is away from that, and that may be the, the right direction for us all to move in. And I'm, I'm open to that. I think even Chief Casper is, is open to that. Um, but the, I guess for me, the point is um, you have to understand, you have to have a, a plan to, to make that transition. And then who is going to fill in those services? Um, um, and respond uh, to those calls. And there's obviously models around the country um, where, where people are doing that. Um, and those are the kinds of things we need to look at. Um, so that I, so you know, my, my answer would be that it may be that there's ways that we could reduce our force, um, but there would have to be a way that we could assure the community that when they called 911 um, for any of those and the many other reasons that they call 911, um, that there is a way for um, that some they are going to be responded to with some sort of service. Great. Yeah, thank you for that answer and for your willingness and your putting those ideas forward. Um, I'm very much in favor of those ideas and uh, hope look forward to working with you on that. Um, I had one more question for you. Um, which was had to do with the the military style equipment that we witnessed on Saturday. Um, that was disturbing to many, uh, including me. And I, you know, just the presence of this equipment can result in an escalation, which could put more people at risk. Um, I've also heard that people were afraid to come and show up and exercise their free speech rights uh, because of the fear of violence, and not by protesters, but by police, as with this equipment here. Um, you know, I read. Chief Casper's response, but I wondered if you had anything to add to that or any thoughts about how we might approach um, demonstrations uh, like this in the future. So yeah, you certainly have seen Chief Casper's response and the, the reasons that she laid out. Um, you know, this was going to be a large event. And so um, uh, there was mutual aid uh, sought, including state police and, um, and other uh, neighboring agencies. And um, I think even the chief herself has said that um, one of the challenges because of the event happening in downtown was, you know, where to, um, to if, if, if these folks were needed, um, where, to, where to properly stage them. And so um, the fact that they were staged in down or near, down, near, near downtown obviously raised concerns with people. Um, and so, you know, that's, I, I appreciate that. I do think that the event, uh, you know, it was a large turnout. Um, and we, in terms of police presence at the actual event itself, um, was minimized as, as we had, had, had said, there were no officers that were out in the crowd, uh, no officers that were, you know, part of the, you know, that were dispatched as part of the march. Um, we basically worked to try to uh, keep the traffic flow, um, uh, you know, shutting down Main Street when it became a, uh, apparent that the crowd was going to march and, and go on to Main Street. Uh, we tried to put safety measures in place to make sure that nobody would try to um, harm uh, those people that were protesting by putting up bar barriers so cars could not um, get onto Masonic Street. Um, and so, and again, this was the this was the um, same approach that had happened at other uh, rallies of this of, of of this kind that were happening up and down the valley, including in Holyoke, including in Springfield, including in Greenfield earlier that day. Um, uh, state police were in the community in those communities and were sort of parked um, off site. Um, so um, I I hear those concerns, and that's something certainly we can look at going forward. Um, but when Chief Casper uh, uh, briefed me on this plan and said that she was going to ask for some backup because they were concerned about managing such a large crowd, and if in fact um, there was someone that wanted to um, try to incite violence, uh, not 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 the not the peaceful uh, protesters that were there that were obviously expressing uh, their rights, their their free speech rights, but if there was someone outside. 
uh, that wanted to try to disrupt or create violence. That was really the concern. So, I mean, that's my response at this point, but we can always, uh, we're always looking at these, um, at these events um, after the fact, just like, just like the, the, um, the event that happened on the Monday of last week. Um, the police really looked at that and re-examined um, sort of the physical uh, uh, approach in terms of um, not wanting people to climb on parking garages and climb on buildings, et cetera. Um, and I think that actually was, was quite successful in terms of keeping people safe by keeping them away from the building. So um, we certainly can learn and, um, and I know that uh, we'll, uh, that'll be something that the chief will be looking at um, moving forward for future events. And the issue of on mo this on Monday, um, week ago Monday, of uh, people being pepper sprayed, is is that if any any uh, thing you'd like to say about that? Has that been reviewed, and was that deemed you know something that that w was necessary and would be implemented going forward in such a situation? So you're now asking, uh, we're sort of going from a budget hearing into a, um, yeah. into a review. Of, uh, it's not really, I don't know that it's necessarily part of the agenda or what's on the, uh, so I, I feel like, I, understand. I feel like that's a, those are questions that Chief Casper could, uh, would be better equipped to address. I've obviously spoken to her about them and reviewed those issues, but, um, um, so I think I'd rather try to do that in a different venue with, with the council. If the council wanted us to do that, I just, um, th no, that, 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 that seems appropriate. Yeah. Um, thank you for answering the previous question, which may mm -hmm. also have been a little bit outside, but so that's okay. all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, I see counselor. I see, sorry. I see counselor Nash. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, so during our, you know, and I'm just, I know we're, we're getting a little off topic here. I'm just going to throw my question out there because I, I want people to know that I'm thinking about it and you're thinking about it. I know that we want to get back to discussing the budget here, but um, I did hear through, and all of us heard throughout testimony, uh, uh, disturbing um, interactions between people and our police department. And the, the other thing that became apparent to me is that, that right now we don't have a really good and trusted way for people to bring their concerns forward. Um, and I, I, I wanna thank everybody who's brought them forward in a budget hearing of all places, rather than some sort of civilian review board or something like that. Um, I, I just want to go on record that I think that that is one of the things that I, I think we really need to explore in the very near future. And that, um, and I also want to say, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, that um, I, I appreciate that you want to have a conversation with us. And I want to say that I am so ready to have that conversation as I think my colleagues are, and that we, and that we need to do it with, with speed. We need to do it in a way that, um, that is thoughtful and, and tentative to uh, you know, all, all of the details here of different services, uh, but that I, I, I don't envision something that's gonna stretch out over a year or two. That I, I'm hoping that you know, we're, we're talking about something that's gonna move quickly and um, uh, because that, my sense is people want change and, um, and I want change. And I, I think you said much the same. So um, with all of that said, um, do you have any response to that, um, Mr. Mayor? I think that's, I think, I think the, the what, whatever, um, whatever process or review we put in place would have to look at the issues just like that. Like how our, you know, how, what is our current complaint system is it working? If it's not working, how can we make it work better? I mean, I think those are, and those are, you know, as you, you've heard over the last several weeks um, coming out, um, uh, best practices that are being suggested uh, for communities to look at um, in terms of what are ways that they can improve um, you know, policing in their communities. Um, you know, President Obama came out 
um, I think the middle of last week and, uh, and, and did a town hall on these issues. Um, and then afterwards he um, issued a pledge to mayors around the country uh, around reviewing our use of force policies. Um, I took that pledge. I'm one of, uh, I don't even know how many mayors have taken it, but I did take the pledge. Um, and it is something that I'm committed to, to looking at our use of force policies, which some have pointed to as being some of the most important reforms that you can make um, even that, that have had an effect even more than training, um, uh, you know, even more than um, some of the other uh, things that people have um, suggested that those types of policies and the way um, that officers are limited by how they can um, act. Fortunately, we're, we're doing well in terms of, I mean, our policy almost close, almost exactly aligns with those suggestions. There are some modifications that have to be made, um, but that's an example of we, we, we need to be um, ready and willing uh, to, to scrutinize this carefully and to hear the suggestions and to hear the concerns and figure out, you know, how, wh what are the reforms we need to put in place to address them? Thank you. Um, Councillor, Councillor Labarge, can you unmute? I think you were raising your hand. Um, Yes, um, Councillor Shira, um, I'm down for co-host, and I shouldn't be, but I would like to speak to the mayor, please. You you are purposefully down as co-host so that you can unmute yourself, um, so that's fine. But yes, uh, I'm going to unmute the mayor um, uh, and go ahead and, and ask him what you wanted to ask him. Okay. Um, Mayor, I feel as city councilors that we really do have an opportunity for change. Re-imaging, making a shift in how our police department is running. I think with what we heard from so many people, so many emails, it's telling us as councilors that we need to make a change. I feel we need to think out of the box. And I have never felt that way before as a counselor, but this has really opened my eyes. Just attending that protest on Saturday and seeing children near us and to see our police dressed up in uniforms and thank God I left earlier because when I was told about state police being there and an armored um, truck and so forth, I don't know, I'm not too happy about that. But anyways, what I'm trying to say is that we definitely need to think out of the box. We need to put in place as soon as possible, Mayor, to create a community oversight board with legal power. And I think this is very valuable. I feel some serious changes in policy, culture, and practices are indicative. I agree that city money can be used to develop an exploratory body or hire consultants tasked with researching and developing a set of alternatives to policing. I also feel when we have, which we have heard Chief Jody Casper state in one of her recent messages to um, about policing and so forth and what we're dealing with on the streets and so forth that we need social workers and i'm just saying mayor that i feel that we should hire social workers and when we have a policeman or a policewoman who are retiring to fill those positions with educated social workers who deal with the problems that there are many disabilities on our streets or in our community. And I think to have our police officers going out on the streets, getting a call that there's a disturbance and so forth because of certain disabilities, that's what we have trained social workers for. I have dealt with that all my life as a shift supervisor with many, many people with disabilities. And we're lacking that. 
And I really feel, Mayor, that please take a look at that because Jody Casper herself has suggested of having social workers being placed in the police department. And I think that would help with the situations of having our agencies working with the social workers. And I think that's a good combination between a social worker in the police department, have two of them, one on first shift, one on second shift or whatever. I just think it's valuable. So that's how I feel about this. And I think we need to take a lot of what we've been hearing. I have received over 2,631 emails and plus many calls. And tonight you've heard my phone ring. It just does not stop. And I think the voices in the city are extremely valuable of what is needed here. And I am want to be part of it. I want to be part of that 100%. And I think we definitely need to really put in and create a community oversight board with legal power. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councillor. And you know, thank you for, for all of those ideas that you've put forward. And, and, um, and I, I agree with you that this is an issue that we're hearing from a lot of the community about, and we want to be responsive. And so I you know I, I'm pledged to work with you and other councillors and the council as a, as a body. Um, uh, and, you know, the idea of we may need some, we may need some help. There's obviously lots of folks who are experts in this and experts in this field. We've all been reading them and watching them be interviewed recently um, as we discuss these issues. And it may be that we do need some help um, with that. So, um, so I'm open to all of those things. I guess for me, um, it's sitting down to figure out what that looks like and what, 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 the, what the process is and, um, and who will uh, lead this work. And so I'm open to that conversation. Thank you. Oh, okay. You can hear me? Yeah. Sorry, I muted myself and then I guess I can't use the space bar for some reason to do that anymore. Anyway, um, thank you and Councillor Quinlan. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Your Honor. I, I appreciate the, the discussion tonight. Um, I feel that um, this is what the community was hoping to hear last week. Uh, and, and, you know, certainly with some late nights, uh, we didn't, we didn't get to this discussion, you know, in terms of this being a budget, uh, meeting and, and us discussing, um, you know, not exactly personnel issues, but, but issues outside of the exact money. I, you know, we've heard from a lot of residents that, that the budget should reflect the values of our place. So discussing the values here, I think is completely appropriate. Uh, um, you know, I feel that that's something that we can do here. Um, you know, I, I wanted to ask you a question you had mentioned and, and Councilor Jared, I think brought it up first about uh, your report, uh, your, your team that put together a report on the panhandling uh, and, and a response to, to helping people in that. And I, I noticed in there that it said the police department works with Elliott Homeless Services uh, on a program there. I'm wondering if you can describe that a little bit because I'd like to understand that as how it fits into our emergency response. Um, so Elliott Homeless Services is one of the largest, they sort of a, a, are a valley wide agency that, that, um, that works with, um, houseless and homeless folks in our, in our community. And we, they have, um, they have, uh, street, uh, social workers that are on the streets. Um, I think I'm, actually right now, I think they may have, it's a full-time equivalent right now, but there it's divided between two people. Um, and so we work very closely with them. Um, they're sort of, they are like sort of a social worker on the street. They, they, um, they go out and, um, into camps and, and talk and, and help people try to access services. Um, sometimes when we have, um, you know, issues or, or crime that may occur, um, uh, you know, among, um, homeless folks, um, rather than police um, being the first responder there, we will often work with um, uh, one of the uh, street social workers from Elliott Homeless Services 
to, to have them um, help us work through the issue. So, I mean, that's a, that's a small example of the kinds of things that people are talking about. Um, and so that's, you know, and that one of the things that did come out of that, um, that uh, report, and I, I know you heard from someone who was a, a, a shelter, someone who worked in one of the shelters before, um, was the idea of a, um, of a crisis response team um, that was made up of police, but also had social workers involved um, that were sort of a, a response team um, that could assess you know, what the proper response was. So that was one of the, um, one of the several recommendations that came out of, the, um, of that report. Um, and we're so, you know, we've been working on several of them. Um, sort of the, the, the first and foremost um, recommendation that sort of there was, as we went around and talked to different groups, um, was the idea of having a community, um, you know, resource center. Um, and, um, and that was obviously further exposed during the pandemic um, as Northampton only had overnight shelters. So uh, we've been sort of full speed ahead on that one, but certainly um, the crisis response team is another one that's um, obviously now come to the forefront. Um, so yeah, that's how we work with Elliot and, um, and we have similar relationships with most of the agencies, um, including you know, ServiceNet, um, including CSO, um, and there's a lot of interaction with those agencies. They obviously they don't work for the city. They're not, you know, embedded in the department. Um, but we work with them on folks that are having, um, that are in distress or in need um, and need those professional services. And, and just, uh, just in terms of budgetary, do we do we fund any of their work? Um, in terms of. Uh, Elliot, no, I don't believe so. I mean, most of our social service agencies um, have contracts with the state. Uh, you know, they, they, they're largely funded through state and federal uh, grants. Um, I was on a call uh, yesterday um, with um, um, other municipal leaders, but also folks from all of those agencies up and down the valley. And, um, and so, and there's, you know, always new grant programs that are announced, but typically they're funded um, by contract uh, through, um, you know, uh, uh, state agencies um, or sometimes federal uh, federal grants, um, and so it's typically that's the way it works. We we um, often will support some of those agencies through CDBG program um, through our public services uh, uh, grant program, um, but in terms of the way those services are typically done, it's typically you know by contract. Uh, with a state grant of some kind. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, you know, I really, um, I, I value what you're saying. And, and, and I said the other night, uh, it was it was pretty late, but I said that that I really felt a response uh, by our community to provide mental health as part of our emergency responses is vital. And, and, and I'm glad to see that that's part of what you're talking about. And I'm also glad to see you talking about constructing a process uh, to, to lead the city into a place that, like Councilor Labarge said, we're ready for some change here, uh, but we don't exactly know what that is and, and, and where we, how we get, up, get to there. Uh, so I, I, I appreciate you talking about constructing a process. You know, I'll echo what I said last week. Um, in 2005, Mayor Higgins uh, declared climate change a, an emergency in the city and put together a steering committee to cre create our sustainability plan. You did something very similar last year with panhandling and put together a committee to work on on that. And I think it's time that we look at, at racism. I think it's time we look at uh, our community policing and emergency response. And I think it's time we put together a committee to address that too. So I, I'm, I'm glad to hear you talking about it. And, uh, and thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Okay. Councillors. Councillor Thorpe. If anyone wants to explain one quick second, Councillor Thorpe, um, for some, if any of my Zoom experts out there want to explain to me in chat why half the council can unmute themselves and half them can't, and there's if there's a solution for it, let me know. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Thorpe. I don't have a hand raised button either, Councillor Sierra. So thank you. What? Oh yes. <laughs> Sorry, Councillor Labarge. Excuse me. Yes, when you're a host or a co-host, that disappears. <laughs> I have a question from uh, Mayor Narkowitz. I know he's on mute. Yep. Okay. Yes, Mayor, Mayor, thank you for being here tonight. 
I noticed that you cut the training from the police budget. And I'm wondering how that's going to impact any anti-bias or de-escalation training. Um, again, in terms of that line item, I was trying to essentially mimic what had been proposed um, at your last meeting um, to try to make cuts in OM and make cuts in OMM. Um, you know, uh, we would continue to prioritize um, those trainings, uh, the anti-bias training for, for current and new officers um, and any of the other related trainings. I mean, I think those obviously will be our first priority. Um, so I don't know that it's, it's certainly not going to affect that commitment uh, to that. Um, but, um, but in terms of that's part of many other trainings that our officers have to receive, um, whether it's specialized trainings for people who do, you know, specialized, you know, detective related work. Um, but in terms of those things that are on the forefront of people's minds, um, I don't believe that it will impact that. We will be as committed as ever. Uh, to ensuring that our officers are receiving um, uh, the most, the best and most available training in those areas. Thank you, Mayor. But I, um, I want to like to also echo what uh, the other counselors had said earlier. We, we need a, a major revamp and it's, it's not a bad idea to look at an uh, oversight board. We heard from a lot of our um, um, speakers tonight and, and uh, it, it was it was moving what they've had to hurt to say and I, I was moved by it uh, but but we we do need to make these changes and we also need to look at a, you know look at as a council as a whole some of the ideas that's been coming our way such as you know looking at specific ordinances and policy changes and um, you know we need to have meaningful, meaningful representation when this is going on meaning also we need to uh, include people of color and we need community buy-in so just wanted to make sure. Thank you. I, I agree with everything, Councillor. I agree with you on that. Um, because obviously at the end of the day, um, whatever we present to the community, if there's if it, the feeling that there's not, not been well represented and there's not buy-in, then anything we come up with will, will is bound to fail. It won't be successful or be well received by the community. Thank you. And there, there is a small um, minority community up here, but their voices should still be heard as well. So I just want to make sure. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, so Councillors, um, there's no perfect solution I think we're learning. So making you co-host uh, should mean that you can unmute yourselves, although we're having a little problem with that. But what it does mean is that you lose your raise hand feature. But I can see all of you right now. So just if you physically raise your hand, I'm going to keep a lookout for it, okay? Uh, Bill, Councillor Dwight. <laughs> Thank you for unmuting me. And okay, okay. Um, Amy Stam actually had uh, surrendered cogent report that uh, there's indeed a national movement and a national reckoning. Um, um, it's and I, and I think as I commented before, there's a significant change. And a significant, and more importantly, a significant urgency in the appeal for um, holistic and demonstrable and real change. I mean, it's not, it's clearly not just a desire to decrease at this time, but a, a progressing decrease for all time on um, the current policing systems that exist and how we subsidize those systems here in our community. And, you know, obviously, I, I, I get the sense that the consensus is not just on this council, but I'm getting a vibe from you as well, Your Honor, but also, certainly, <laughs> there is not a single doubt in my mind that there, would, there is a demand, not just a request, but a demand for a structural redesign and approach to what public safety is and what that means and for whom. You know, I, when we first, our first uh, budget presentation, it feels like 42 years ago, but it was uh, a week or so ago, um, I was commenting to uh, Fire Chief Devin that in my tenure here, there has been a profound and structural change in what the fire, what used to be the fire department is now fire and rescue department is. 
it's a, it was a significant cultural shift. It did not come without any shortage of pain. There was a lot of pain, a lot of controversy. But consequently, what evolved was a system that, in this case, it was a much easier, in some respects, a much easier transition to make for firefighters because as we became very good at reducing um, fires and fire safety and, and in increasing fire safety. So as a result, there was little for them to do or becoming less and less for them to do. And when we switched to ambulance and EMT responses, um, um, another proactive public safety service, it, it imbued that department with a new sense of, of value, but it also changed their name, changed their attitudes, it changed their sense of mission. And we're talking about sense of mission here and what's the mission of this community. And obviously, you know, as I continue to say, we're, we can haggle over this small portion of a line item. And I understand people's frustration of the fact that that does not represent or indicate anything that looks like a sea change, a, 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 an epiphany of sorts. We are, um, you know, the more urgent appeal I heard was for us to understand what drives this call, this unprecedented call from um, so many members of our public and so many members of the people that we are called upon or we asked to represent. So I'm having a, you know, <laughs> I need, before I go farther on the budget, I need to have more than just a sense of, you know, I, I, I do believe that what everyone's expressed is this desire to move forward and improve. But I don't know what that means, and I don't know how that manifests. I need to feel like or get a better sense of that this is, that we actually seize this moment, that we go beyond just this vote and we go beyond just uh, conversations and committees. I need to get a sense that we're uh, basically allied in trying to um, achieve what has been asked of us. And it's not just, uh, you know, a defunding of the police, at least I would say it's beyond that, it's what in, as I said before, what it means to be policed and for whom and for what. And um, in some way, I actually would hope that for many police officers it would actually come as a relief as well. But what do we demand? What do we require from, um, from agencies that we supposedly have authority over? What do we want from them? And is it just and fair? So I don't really have a direct question other than I just, it is, I just wanted to press upon you that um, I, am, I am indeed shaken to my core, not only from the testimonies, but also the volume. Um, and I'm not talking about noise, I'm talking about size and dimension and scope. And I, we have, I mean, our portion of the reckoning is here tonight and it doesn't stop here. It is merely an initial step. So as we have this conversation, I want to get a sense of just what the hell that is. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, if there's, um, if you're, Mayor, would you like to respond or should I go to? Uh, I, I, I wasn't quite sure if, if it was a question, um, but, uh, but, I, but I, I, I hear what Councillor Dwight is saying. I understand that. I think it's, um, I agree that we are at a, um, that we are at a, a turning point um, and we, um, 
there's really only one direction we can go. Um, and so I think the, we'll, I think in terms of what comes next, I think we'll be judged on what comes next. I mean, we're elected officials, we're elected by this community um, to represent our constituents and represent you know, what the residents of our community want. And so, I mean, to me, that's going to be the, that's going to be the judge. The, those will be the judges of, of what we do next um, and whether it's, whether it's you know, meeting the demand that you're describing in the community. So um, I'm committed to that. And, um, and I think as a nation, we have to be committed to that. Um, so I'm, I'm, that's, that's about the best way that I can answer is just to sort of agree with you and um and commit myself to working with folks to um to really make the real change that people are asking for okay councillor mayori i saw your hand then councillor foster good evening everyone thank you for the recess for uh an anxious belly bureau to open a present <laughs> um, i appreciate your patience I just wanted to say, you know, I have been really moved. I'm sure we all have the mayor of without the level of concern in our community and the wrenching stories. Um, I'm so impressed with the level of knowledge. Um, I feel like the, we have so many uh, community members who know certainly much more than I do. And I would, I'm anxious to work with them because of that. You know, I was uh, prepared last Thursday to to cut the, the proposed budget because of those concerns and uh, fond reflection. Um, I'm prepared to do that this week. Um, what I'm hearing, especially in the last 24 hours, is that the proposed uh, cuts to the PD in, in front of us is not enough, are, are, not, are not enough, and I agree. Uh, I agree that, that to make fundamental change in Northampton to our public safety system, so much more is needed. I think the change does need to be thoughtful, but it does not need to be gradual. I've been hearing, um, particularly for more cuts to the budget, I'm willing to discuss those. I, um, I, what I can say at this moment to everyone who's reached out, which we know is thousands, basically at this point in some form, is that I want to let you all know that I am committed to this fundamental change and to exploring further cuts to the, the, the uh, police department um, to do so. And uh, I also wanna know that we all have acknowledged that the budget cuts are just one piece of the picture that we need um, other, what we've been talking about, transformative change. Uh, I think what's happened in the past with trying to involve our community um, is that there hasn't been enough authority or independence or fair representation. And that is why they may not, not might not be showing up to a meeting, for example, with the with the chief. Um, they don't have, as uh, Councillor Thorpe said, the buy-in. So um, I believe that we need, uh, uh, for council, I think we need a select committee to, to look at all of this, to look at alternatives to policing, to look at police expenditures, to uh, look at how to establish a truly independent civilian review board because oversight is what I, has been shown to be the greatest deterrent to the use of excessive force by police, not training. Um, we need to look at where to reallocate the money um, and we need to uh, really use a committee the mayor, mayor, you can. It'll be, I would love to work with you, and you can have um, your, you know, you can have a task force, and you can do things through the executive branch. I think we need something through the legislative branch, so we can identify legislative options, so these initiatives have teeth, because we will be able to know what kind of legislation will support all that. Um, and I think we need as many eyes and voices, uh, you know, to reimagine our public safety and, uh, system in Northampton. I don't want to lose this energy. I don't want to lose this opportunity. I don't know how to leave this budget season right now feeling and having other people reassured that we are truly on a path, a path that's different and the path that has accountability um, and the path that's, you know, willing to dream bigger. For our city. So, you know, what I, what really was what read it was resonating across our country and in our 
beautiful uh, little city here um, is that it's, it's past time to put public back in public safety um, in a meaningful way. And that's what I'm looking for from all of us. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor. Um, in terms of, um, I, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm trying to th think of a, 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 a way um, to respond other than to just you know acknowledge what you're saying and agreeing that that uh, people are wanting um, immediate change and want to know that that's going to happen and um, so part of it I think is going to be to figure out whether is a council you know select committee one way to go is there um, you know like I'm having a mayor's committee some way to go or I would suggest is there a hybrid of the two is there is there you know a, a way that the council and the mayor can work together on this issue so that's that's part of what I was um, hoping to explore with the council but obviously you have that um, you have that capacity within your rules to do select committees um, I can say that we also know that you know formation of new agencies etc is not something that's done by ordinance so, um, so that's so it does require um, executive involvement in that process as well, um, which again, as I think, is a reason to have to do it to do this together. But um, obviously, your the council is an independent branch of government and um, and can go. Uh, and it can obviously work um, in any way it chooses. Um, I just wanted to extend to the council um, that I share the commitment to having this community conversation and trying to make the changes that we're hearing uh, people want us to make, so. Right, I'll just add yes, please, and all of that. I just think we need it all. I think that this is a huge problem. I would love to work with you, and, and, and you're correct about the executive branch, and we need legislative options, but we also need for our community a sense of, you know, balanced uh, accountability between um, different uh, branches of our government, and so, yes, I, I, I kind of think we need all of those things. <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't disagree, and all of us are held accountable. Uh, you no, know, I'm an elected official, you're all elected officials, um, so we are all accountable to the, the, the residents and the taxpayers. I see you, Councillor Labarge, but Councillor Foster is next. Thank you, uh, President Sharon. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to share a few thoughts um, and I, I will get to more of a budget question. Um, but I just wanted to say, you know, and reiterate from last week, I have emailed and spoken with so many constituents uh, in the last week and it's really been incredibly powerful. Um, you know, constituents, uh, people of color, um, people who are trans, domestic violence survivors have reached out to me to share their story. And I recognize um, and want to center and honor the courage that that takes, um, you know, and, and to, to experience a trauma and then to share it again, and then to share it in the process of trying to affect change that just uh, takes enormous amount of courage. And uh, I'm really grateful for that. I've also had constituents reach out to me and say, you're my counselor and I want you to represent my view too. Um, so I, I'm going to do that. And I think that this is part of the context. Um, you know, I, I think we're getting to this point where we recognize the role of policing uh, is outsized in our community and across the country. Um, we are calling on police for issues where we should not be calling on a police armed law enforcement response. Um, I talked with a constituent who has um, an adult son with um, an intellectual disability and there are times that she's actually had to call the police for support with him. No, I, I can tell you, I have two little boys. No mother wants to call the police on their son, but she has nowhere else to turn. The social service agencies um, that we're talking about, you, you know, I think I've worked in human services for 20, I don't even want to say how long, 20 years. They're chronically underfunded. Um, we're looking at agencies that often experience high staff turnover and that don't have yet right now this red hot minute the capacity to respond so what's happening is the re the police are ramping up they are responding to these moments um 
that's not what we as a community are saying we want to see as a response. Um, we're looking at seeking people who are trained to respond to the issues um, that people are currently calling the police for. We're talking about addiction. Uh, we're talking about, you know, issues that come along with poverty and homelessness, um, mental health issues. Um, so many of these, these calls in theory, yes, can be handled by people trained to handle them, but we have to shore up those resources in order to do it. So I, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, you know, I, I am somebody in my professional life. I work with state contracts and, and I recognize it's, um, it's a way that many agencies are funded. It can be a tedious process and it also incentivizes cutting costs and that when you cut costs, often um, services and the, the very things people are asking, which is if you're in crisis and you've been in crisis before and you're calling for a crisis response, it would be great if you knew the counselor if it wasn't somebody brand new on the job. Um, so that's just, you know, uh, just naming an issue with this that I think we need to be looking at. Um, Northampton, is a city that is progressive and isn't um, afraid to step forward. I mean, we're in our charter review recommendations, we're looking at extending the vote to 16 year olds. Um, we've, the charter review committee has recommended um, that we extend the vote uh, to non-citizens who reside in Northampton. These are amazing progressive steps. And when we look at the role of policing and how we want our city and our society to run, these are steps that we can continue with. Um, so what I see here, and, and I promise I'm getting to a question, um, but that we do have a commitment to change and all, all of these voices, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people have sat through hours of city council meetings because they are that dedicated to change. Um, and we have a community right here with an awful lot of expertise as well as other police departments um, across the country who have moved toward change. Um, and I really, think it's imperative that we look at the examples of what other departments are incorporating as well as look to the expertise in our community. Um, I would say that I think it's important for the legislative and the executive branch to work together on this so that it's a unified solution. Um, with that being said, I, I also see that we need to center the voices of people of color, um, you know, survivors of abuse, the GLBT community, as well as people working with these populations to ensure that that any solutions we look at are really um, informed and as Councillor Thorpe mentioned, have the buy-in uh, of the community. Um, you know, just one, I would like to echo the calls for his Philly and Oversight Commission. Um, you know, I recognize how powerful that is. Um, and also I, I mentioned this last week, uh, I recognize that the legislative branch is not able to um, appropriate funds, I, I respect that um, I would just call for uh, the need for city resources to go towards solving this issue um, without dedicated staff time and resources. Um, that's what it's going to take to make real meaningful substantive and lasting change. So maybe I didn't, after all, just a very long comment. Okay. Um, is there someone who hasn't spoken yet other than me who would like to speak before I go to Councillor Labarge? Okay, I'll give you another chance. Here's Councilor, Councilor Labarge. Here you go. Um, thank you, Councilor Foster, um, for your thoughts. Very well respected. But hearing from what I heard from many, many people in this city is to create, create a community oversight board with legal power. That's what they're asking for. And you heard Chief Jody Casper state she attempted to try to have a citizens group and nobody would cooperate with that. By having and creating a community oversight board with legal power, yes, you put people of color, people of any color can go on that board. But we have a problem here. And people have asked for that to be put in place. And I think that's very, very valuable here. And I'm going to give you reasons why. I have a nephew of color. From the time that he was a little boy, going into kindergarten, he has been bullied, bullied, right up until he now has a, a little girl and his wife, 
but that was a terrible life for him. And I think what I've heard from many, many people, and I'm going to keep that in my heart, that we need to create a community oversight board with legal power, with legal power. Being a city councilor for a long period of time, I've seen different committees being formed and so forth. Here we had a charter commission. And what did we hear? We heard our civil rights Bill Newman come forth and say that city council is losing their power. I don't want us to be able to have to lose our power. I've asked the mayor to create a community oversight board with legal power. We need that also on the side in the city to let people be able to go in and look and see how the programs are going in there or, or anything like that. They should have the right to be able to do that. So that's all I'm asking is what I'm hearing from not one, two or hundred people, from thousands of people telling me what is needed in the city and I am voicing for them. I think it's crucial that we form that committee also. Besides us counselors going through um, city service or legislative matters or community resources, that's fine. But we, they're asking to have another committee put in place. So I think that's in dire need. Thank you, Gina Louise. You're welcome. Um, other comments? I will, um, I'll take the opportunity to say that I'm certainly glad that we all seem to agree that the time is past due to examine how we handle not only policing, but broader public safety and health in all senses and figure out how to handle these issues, these, these issues of people's lives and of life and death that have ended up under policing, even though they don't necessarily fit there. Um, I've spoken to Chief Casper about this before, and I know that she's very thoughtful and open about the social services that have come under the purview of the police um, because of the systemic federal and state defunding of services for decades. Um, I think that Chief Casper is someone who is willing to have the needed conversations. I believe we can have them here and that we will be able to put action behind the words. I, I know that there is hurt. I know there is distrust and the courage and the strength and the heartbreak of the testimony evidences why. Um, but I do think that there is a way forward. And I, I thank Councillor Dwight for demanding more specificity on it. Um, as the mayor said, he reached out to me and we both agree that we need change on how we handle public safety. Um, I thank him and I thank Chief Casper for listening along with us these many, many hours, um, for reading all the testimony that has come into us. They have been listening and, and sharing it with us. Um, I, I appreciate that the mayor understands that change is needed and that we must work together. And I appreciate him committing to do that. I will be holding him to that commitment to not just include the council president or the council, but to partner with us. I have heard interest from the council for committees. That is certainly a step that we can take, but we do not have jurisdiction over departments or staff. We can have a study request, we can have a select committee, but I don't wanna just issue a report or put forward recommendations. I don't want the council to just have a seat at the table or some sort of council representation, I want us to work together towards reform because I, as was said, I think it needs both the executive and the legislative branches of, of our government. It needs us who are the representatives of our constituents and it needs the chief executive who also has constituents as he noted, um, but oversees and is responsible for the departments and their staff. So I think it's vital that we work together and I thank you for being willing to partner with us, Mayor, and I'm gonna hold you to it. And um, I, I hope that we can get started on this work very quickly. Thank you. Counts, um, Counselor Dwight. 
Um, I, I also don't want to overlook the fact that we're actually part of a continuum, we're part of a structure that everyone's identified as well. We are um, one small community within a network, a state, and a federal government. And the energy that we are uh, responding to, or the energy that we feel has to be, and hopefully is, shared towards Boston and in, in lesser form because I'm not confident there towards DC. But the fact is, is that a number of, uh, a number of the solutions that we are considering or have been mentioned, actually we're not allowed to do them. We're literally not allowed to do them. We're not, we don't have the authority to, they're not, they're not part of our tax law. They're not embedded in, our, in, in the way uh, community governance is handled. And they, I mean, for instance, housing. I would love to devote a significant portion of our, our funding towards the actual development of housing. We do, we have facilitated housing um, through uh, zoning changes and we've done it through um, the, the, the <laughs> so sorry. Um, we, we actually have a tax aspect that is devoted to uh, that was especially established to help develop housing, but we don't, we can only help and establish those places. We don't provide subsidies. We don't have the means to do that. We don't uh, subsidize NGOs, um, short of what the, the mayor has described uh, through grant programs of, as I said, Dwindling resources, CBDG money, community development block grant funds uh, have been throttled down to the point where they're now just an insult to any agency that has to go through the, the very long and arduous task just to appeal for $500. That means nothing. Um, the same thing coming from the state, their their ongoing desire to basically leave everything, all subsidies and, uh, I mean, all revenues and subsidization of all systems to local communities that don't have the resources, nor do they have the authority to do those things. We, we, uh, we're, we've evolved into this progressive taxation system from a progressive taxation system to a very regressive taxation system that essentially honors supports and provides for property owners and does not provide for those who are not property. And at the same time, putting the onus on people on, on limited incomes um, and on the people who are most vulnerable. So for the folks who've been testifying to us, I think I would like to share our culpability, if you will. If you, uh, we need, that same amount of commitment and energy from that we have witnessed now and we will continue to witness, I'm sure. I need it amplified, we need it amplified out beyond this Zoom meeting. It's got to go, it's got to go to your uh, state rep, your, your state senators. And I actually know that you will find uh, sympathetic ears there, but then it's got to go even further where they can take this and actually create uh, actions that have real value that can be translated down um, to those of us with uh, in the community with very limited means and very limited uh, authority. So um, you're hearing my bumbling frustration, <laughs> my inarticulate frustration and that I share with you all and I don't know, I mean, you know, the appeal of course is uh, tonight for us to defund or one, to eliminate the entire police budget, that's one, uh, two, uh, reduce it significantly depending on various numbers from anywhere from I think 35% to 65%. Um, and I don't know, I mean, I honestly don't know. I, I, I struggle with that and I don't, I honestly, given the fact that I don't know, 
that, you know, we've, Minneapolis has been brought up as an example, but Minneapolis Council is a, is a completely different structure system as well as um, their largest, most wealthiest populous city in the state of Minnesota. And if we defund a department to the point that, we, and plus we can't reallocate, if we defund and create essentially a vacuum for some of the things that Councilor Foster had mentioned, um, some of the, the very real valuable work that needs to be addressed, but we don't have, we don't have the support systems behind it. We have this dysfunctional system that has armed police officers responding to crises that only, as people have mentioned, only make matters worse in many cases. So I did, so you're witnessing my struggle, as it were, but I don't know. I honestly, I cannot bring myself to propose uh, such a large cut at this time, given the fact that I don't know how we address the issues that would result, that would benefit, actually have a benefit for people. So I said you're still, still just sort of um, <laughs> at a loss. Those are excellent points. Uh, I see Councillor Jarrett. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, Councillor Dwight, thank you for kind of feel, you know, I, I feel that, um, <clears throat> that feeling like what, what do we do? Uh, and what if we did this thing, what would fill the vacuum? And um, I, I share that concern of, of not knowing. Um, I want to give a statement um, that I wrote today, and um, I think we'll address some of some of the things we're thinking about. Um, so I think Northampton has uh, a racism problem that every city does. We are not immune to the systemic racism we're seeing throughout the country. And I've been listening to people of color, mostly black people who describe what it is like to be black in Northampton, to be followed um, with an officer's gun, a hand on their gun, um, to be stopped for picking a blackberry from the side of the road and that be the reason, um, to be called a uh, hey boy and questioned and most the white people I talk to in town are, think that our police department is doing just fine. And it is, it's very clear to me that, that we aren't. Um, then there's also issues of which crimes uh, are prioritized to investigate. Um, wage theft is a much bigger problem than property theft. Nationwide, it's almost three times. And that primarily affects people of color and low-income people. Um, so just a couple of different ways uh, in which, you know, we, that we have issues. Um, I also want to say, you know, I'm a believer in the goodness of each person. And even when we're put into a system that makes us, know, you know, make choices that we know aren't always right. Um, I think most members of our police department care about people and want the best for their community. And I think there's valuable work that is done by the police every day. I don't agree with demonizing individuals. I think that will create separation, but holding individuals responsible for their actions is crucial, um, especially those in you know, higher positions of power. And the systemic change um, will really bring about as opposed to just individual, you know, prosecuting individuals, this is systemic change. Um, so I'm a strong supporter of alternatives to policing, both to do the emergency response work in a way that leads to better outcomes and to support the people who are being policed instead of policing them. If we meet people's basic human needs, uh, we will reduce the need for policing. And I don't think we will have the best outcomes if we rush this process. I want us to reduce the police budget further, but I want to know what we are replacing it with and have a plan in place. Um, as was mentioned, you know, the reality is that, that the people we have doing emergency response work now uh, are the police along with fire rescue, and they are doing some of the public health work, mental health work, addiction work, traffic details, work with the unhoused. Um, I think we need to shift that and it needs to be as fast as we are able. Um, but with a plan. 
And um, I am to think that a plan to create a separate department is necessary. So called by dispatch as appropriate. I think if this was under um, the police, we would not have the necessary separation. I know council can't do that, but I'm just stating what I'm hearing and what um, my thoughts. Um, so I you know my job is to think beyond the short term. It's to create lasting progress. Um, that means you know risking my position to do the right thing. And, um, you know, I think the energy that we have now will help us get started. And to all of you who are advocating now, we will need your help in this process to make sure we have the voices of those who are most affected in the decision making process to make sure it keeps moving. Um, some of these things have already been talked about, um, but creating a body, you know, to explore alternatives to policing. Um, the council or together with the mayor, I do think we should be have our own um, committee to explore the legislative action that's connected to this. And um, to look at legislation to increase public safety. Um, I think we saw this with the results of the select committee on pesticide reduction, where we created policy that the executive branch implements, um, which is per our, our, our charter, uh, the civilian oversight board, um, with the independent power. Um, we need to ensure that our police union contracts don't imperil public safety. Um, uh, and I would love to see us uh, implement participatory budgeting, um, which is a democratic process in which community members decide how to spend part of our budget. Um, and we don't have to make a rush decision tonight. Um, in eight days, we take a second reading. I'm thinking it's great that we're talking about our budget options now. Um, and then lastly, a um, question, you know, I guess if we, we're, we're sort of at this moment where we have this power about, um, and we don't have it for another year. And um, I you know, is there the, what, where, I just wanna bring up the idea of if we reduce and basically require additional appropriation later, does that give us power to make sure that things are uh, implemented <laughs> that we wanna see, or is that just completely beyond our power and be considered you know, meddling with the executive branch action? It's, it's something to, that I have, I have a legal question about. And look at that. Ah, Alan Seawald. He was waiting for the moment. <clears throat> um, can, can you just repeat that question for me? I just want to make sure I understood your question. So if we reduce um, a budget now, a line item, um, and essentially ask for a, you know, the mayor to come with an additional appropriation later um, <clears throat> as a way to hold him accountable to what we see, you know, constituents advocating for, and what we uh, what would like. Um, <clears throat> what is the legality of that? Well, tonight um, you're voting on a, a general fund budget. Um, your vote will stand alone. Um, you can send the message to the mayor that he's welcome to come back with a supplemental um, appropriation request, but he's always free to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's 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 no legal effect to your um, cutting and re, uh, with a request to come back with a supplemental appropriation as a way to control how the mayor is spending the money. Um, I don't. I think that the mayor has the discretion within each um, org of the budget. You know, um, P S O M O O M to determine how the money is spent, and so. Um, there's really no legal effect to it, uh, to your request to uh, come back with a supplemental appropriation request. Mm -hmm. I, um, can, I, can I try to address that, Councillor Jarrett? Um, yeah. I guess I would say that if we, um, if we move forward in this process and we identify um, things that have to, that will require funding in order to effectuate it, um, I would put forward that funding. I, I, I you know, I, I don't, I, 
if I was part of a process to determine what what sort of reforms or changes are needed, um, I would put forward the request to make it happen. I mean, that's been my, um, if you look at my track record in terms of, you know, when I put together, when I, when we spend time studying issues, whether it's, you know, looking at our parking system, um, and there's a set of recommendations about technology we should be buying. I've sort of systematically gone through and followed those recommendations and requested the funding to pay for the technology. Um, we just talked about the aforementioned uh, uh, study around panhandling, and I've come to you to create um, some of the initial financial mechanisms to be able to explore the resilience hub, um, uh, which was you know one of the one of the top items that we heard not only from um, you know social service, but it's actually the top issue that we heard from. Um, people on living on the streets. That was their number one issue that they wanted us to pursue first and foremost. So I brought forward, you know, we've, we've been pursuing grants and we brought forward orders to effectuate that. So, you know, that would be my commitment that if we come up with solutions that we would come up, try to come up, we would come up with the funding to do it. Uh, with right. Obviously, you know, with all the normal caveats about where we are in the, you know, economy and whatever's happening at the time, I can't predict that, but obviously that would be my commitment. And if we, um, you know, go through that process and uh, come to a point, say in, in a number of months, but before the end of the fiscal year, that we want to, for example, you know, establish a, a, a separate um, response team than the police, what would be the you know, could, are, are you able to um, direct, direct funds, uh, or I guess you could do a transfer of a order, right? If, if that was what, where we were at, you could That's correct. Tran transfer um, and potentially, you know, we understand this would mean laying off police officers at a certain point um, with those, if, if they were, uh, if those services were provided by a different uh, organization or department. Um, so, okay. Just, yeah, uh, I mean, the, we, we, as you know, the doc, you know, we, we vote on a budget, but then it's sort of a living document throughout the fiscal year. So we're often coming to you throughout the fiscal year to transfer funds, um, you know, between, um, between, you know, OM, PS, um, uh, occasionally we have additional funds that we want to appropriate, you know, for grants or things like that, or we appropriate money to the schools that are grants that are passed. So, I mean, we're always, um, there's always that possibility. Obviously we just have to stay with, you know, we, we have to stay within our levy limit um, and we have to have the funds to do it. Um, but beyond that, um, that certainly would be how the process would work. Um, and we've made, you know, we've done, We've done reorgs. I've done reorgs, um, you know, as part of, uh, you know, all through my time as mayor, where we've merged departments together, where we've, you know, um, where we've come, I've come to you to make budgetary changes. Um, we made changes after the charter to, to separate and give the council its own independent staff person that was not merged with an executive branch. And that was something that happened mid year and we came up with the funding for that. So um, that's, that's part of the normal course of of um, of managing our, our our local government throughout the year from a budgetary standpoint. All right. Well, let other counselors uh, talk about any of the ideas, the thoughts I put forward. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Mayori. Yes. Well, uh, first of all, I I deeply deeply appreciate you you're voicing your commitment, Mayor. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, since this is our first reading of the budget, and then we have a second reading next Thursday, there's time in that week um, for us to do a little bit more and perhaps get some of that commitment down uh, before we uh, vote again and finalize this budget. Uh, certainly, I'm 
happy to speak with the, I mean, to, to, to have our, my conversation, more extended con conversation with the council president um, uh, to talk about that, that certainly, you know, and come back to you with some, some initial thoughts about what that structure may look like. Um, I certainly can commit to that. Again, a lot of the things we're talking about are, are you know, we're, we're, are gonna require study and thought, but in terms of the actual process and how it would be structured, that's certainly something we can talk about and try to lay, um, put together some kind of an outline of what that could be, or possibly even a structure, possibly even a structure of what that might look like um, between now and next Thursday. Well, I appreciate that. And I, I understand, I feel the same way. There's a lot of uh, research. And, um, we wanna make sure we're doing what's, what's right for our city. Um, I just think we have an opportunity since we have this week. And I understand we're in a terrible budget situation locally and nationally uh, and globally. Uh, but I do think some amount of funding to, in, to get some backbone to, to, to changes we'd like to make would, would kind of be putting our money where our mouth is. Um, thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, I'm, I'm happy to work with you this week on that, Mayor. Um, Councilor Labarge, I saw your hand. Yes, I was having a problem listening to um, Councilor Muir. It seemed like every time she would move back, whatever, something was like hitting and you I couldn't understand what she was saying half of the time. Yeah, right there, that thing right there. Okay. Um, yeah, I I know that people are having trouble hearing um, some of us at times. So let's all try and be mindful of that and speak as loudly as we can. And whatever microphone we're using, um, try and have it be as close to our mouths as possible. You want um, me to recap or you, you want to, uh, Councilor Shear, just recap for uh, Councilor Labarge, just briefly what I said. So oh, she that's okay. 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 Well, basically, I was saying we have a week here to, to get some changes down before we finalize the budget next Thursday. Okay. Counselors. Oh, Councilor Foster. I'd like to thank both Councilor Jarrett and, and Councilor Mayori for sharing your thoughts and similar. Um, my notes is highlighted and I didn't say it, um, but I, I think uh, I just want to echo that I see the value of working with the mayor on this. Um, and I know you're committed to this process. And so I, I look forward to, to us all being able to move this forward. Um, and to echo Councillor Mayori, I've been struggling with the actual task at hand, which is this budget order in front of us. And I've been struggling with that in my, my comfort level um, with it, if if get a crack at this until June, um, but I have seen over just even the past few months how we are looking at financial orders. Um, but that being said, more of a structure, more teeth, um, and more ideas um, before we're taking a second vote uh, would mean an awful lot to my uh, commitment to how we're approaching this issue. I that's my commitment to see what we can do. Um, I have school committee tomorrow night, but we'll have um, and some other meetings along the way. But I, my commitment is to work uh, with the council president and see if we can come up with something that we can bring back to people to um, to give them that confidence in terms of where we're headed. Councilors, Councilor Nash. We can't hear you, Councillor Nash. You're not muted, but we can't hear you. Oh, what is going on? Hello? Yeah, hi. There we go. Welcome. Okay. Um, so um, based on the discussion that we've had uh, thus far and 
with the emerging commitments that are starting to get discussed, um, I am comfortable voting um, for the mayor's budget as proposed tonight. Um, and I, I wanna say and underline that I'm doing that with the, with the idea that there's a lot of work ahead. And, and, I, um, and um, we've gotten a lot of feedback that we need to move and I hear the movement, but I, I'm comfortable voting yes on this tonight with the commitment that next week we're gonna have more stuff to bring to the table. So thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to remind people what's on the floor at the moment. So this is a motion to adopt the FY 2021 general fund budget minus the um, the $38,000 line item that has been removed. So this is a motion to adopt. This is not the order, which we will get to later. We just to take you through the next two steps. This is a motion to adopt. Then once we vote on this, we will take up, uh, Councilor Jarrett will remove himself again. We will take up the um, $38,000 line item. And um, once we vote on that, Councilor Jarrett um, will still stay removed and we will take up the order, which is now order number 20.065 in order to approve the FY 2021 general fund budget. Um, and we will vote on that. That is the entire, that order for the entire budget that includes the, what is, we are currently not, what we currently have separated out. So that's where we are in the process. That's the motion on the floor is to adopt the budget. Then we will vote on the on a motion to approve the order, which is the entire budget. That's your recap, Councillor Foster. Thank you. And just um, I realized we were talking about a second reading, but to people unfamiliar with council, I hope you don't mind me just pointing out that we. In city council, we take two votes on most issues. And so a vote tonight is one vote, but nothing is finalized until we've taken a second vote, which would happen in our next regular scheduled meeting. That is correct. That is how we do it. It's not how everyone does it, but it's how we do it on most things, as you said, not all, but most we take, uh, we do two readings on it. We are in the first reading right now. If something fails in first reading, it does not continue on to a second reading. Um, but if something passes in first reading, it has a second and final reading before it passes entirely. Councillor Jarrett. Thank you. Um, yeah, and just to be clear also, uh, if, some, if this fails in first reading, the budget passes as is. So um, that, just to explain my vote, although I have concerns, I will vote yes, because I, do, I don't want to see it fail and then us not to have an opportunity to keep talking. So I'm not, wouldn't do a protest vote or anything like that tonight. Um, and I am heartened, I, I am looking forward to, you know, the mayor and the council president working together um, and getting more details on what, what we will vote on or to, to inform us uh, for voting next week. Um, I do, uh, and you know, I'm, I am concerned about accountability. Um, I don't mean any disrespect uh, to, to you, Mayor, because I, I do have great respect for you and for the, um, the, the budget you've put together. And, um, but I just need to name that as a concern and something that I think we should keep, keep talking about in terms of if we're going to do full funding. Um, I would want to see that the plan um, be, you know, a, a, a really strong plan. Um, so that's just a thought there. And with that, um, I do have some questions about items other than the police budget. Um, but I, we, we can, uh, I can let other people uh, talk, uh, or if we want to finish up this particular aspect. 
Um, I'll just thank you for making that very excellent point. Um, and actually for all of your very beautifully said points this evening, Councilor Jarrett, but that is a good point about, so the, the budget is special um, and uh, according to the charter and I think maybe also according to mass general law, we, um, if we do not, if we vote against it or vote it down, it becomes enacted. It's a different thing than um, other things that are before us that they would just stop. The budget cannot stop, it, it goes forward, um, even if it does not pass in first reading here. Um, so thank you for making that point. Um, are there other comments before we, I go back to Councillor Jarrett with his other questions on anything but that removed line item? Okay, seeing none, Councillor Jarrett, you have the floor again. Okay. Um... So, the if if you could talk, I mean, so first in, in general, you know, I'm very impressed by this budget in the face of the challenges that we're facing. Um, I really appreciate that you didn't ask for the override amount this year, and that you funded our schools as fully as possible. There were two departments: the auditor and the city clerk, where I'm seeing seven and a half percent and eight point one percent rise. And I wondered if you could explain that. Uh, sure. Um, so you said the city clerk's office. Um, that's basically election workers. Um, the costs of um, running elections and particularly now that we're doing early voting um, and we now have to have election workers paid uh, for, I think it's like five or seven days prior. Um, so I know that that was one of the requests. The other piece is the hourly rate um, has gone up. Um, so it's sort of a combination of um, the, the clerk anticipating more um, uh, elections. And, you know, we're in a, a year where we know we're going to have a, um, well, we've already had one election, uh, the state uh, primary um, that happened the same time as the um, override. And then the, um, and then we have the presidential, uh, I'm sorry, the we had the presidential primary, and then we'll have, um, you know, the the state senate primary, uh, which will happen, um, and then we'll have the presidential election. So, um, so that's that's really the the um, uh, I think the main driver in terms of the um, the city clerk's office, um, and the other one, the auditor one. I got. I'm just going to look at that one. I think they had, um, I think those are primarily contractual increases in their line item. And then um, I believe they did a hiring, uh, when they hired an employee, they, they hired somebody who was um, coming from another department and they are, um, they came in at a higher uh, step scale than the person that they replaced. So it, um, so that was sort of, so basically it's, it's wage related. We're not adding more staff um, um, in the auditor's office. It was a combination of their, um, of their contractual obligations. And then the fact that we had um, brought someone in that had, that's coming in at a higher grade because of their experience and tenure in the city. Um, I just wanna pull up that one uh, just quickly. Just, I mean, just to sort of keep it in, in, uh, scale the um so yeah the auditor's office um uh you know that's a that's a budget that's you know 368,000 is the proposal and so 25,000 of that is represented in that change um we actually hired somebody from the city clerk's office who um Gail you may folks may know who worked in the city clerk's office for um and so already as opposed to an entry level person that had typically filled that role. So that's sort of where the salary shift occurred. Great, thank you. Yep. Councilor Quinlan. Uh, thanks, Councilor Jared, because I, I looked at the- uh, Your sounds well. all funky. Something's going on. He's out. Okay. No, we can't hear you though. Okay, I think, how about yep. that? All yep. right. 
So I looked at the auditor's office as well, Councillor Jarrett, and I thank you for pointing that out. But I, so I guess, Mayor, what you're saying, I, just so I understand, the payroll and AP coordinator position, both of those are $9,000 increases per, uh, you know, compared to last year. So it represents a large amount of that. And that's because, like you said, we've hired someone there that's, that was at a higher level. So does the other one just have to fall into line there? So they have to be the same? It just seems like an awful lot. So it jumped out to me too. Yeah, um, I'm at, so I, I'm wondering, um, the finance director who oversees the auditor's office may be okay. able to, there she is, Susan Wright, she may be able to better explain this than I'm explaining it currently. So. You should be. You're also, unmuted, Susan. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I believe I'd have to look at the budget, but I believe both of those are new employees, um, and so they are were hired at higher steps than the people that were there before. The two employees before were much lower level, um, it, it, much newer in their careers. One came from outside the city. One. Um, had just moved up in the city, but the two that are there now had a great deal more experience when they were hired. So they're just being hired higher up in the scale. Okay. Um, so all of these positions are on a pay scale and the pay that they're getting is consistent with the scale that they're on and in the union that they're in. Right. So if you come in, if you, if you come into an office and you have other years of experience in the city, they don't start you at the step one. They generally acknowledge that you have those other steps. So that's sort of what happened. So they started at a higher step scale. Right, and that that has to do, I assume, with, with the union, how, the, how they get placed that way because of the union, because they have seniority of some sort. That's correct. These are both AFSCME, AFSCME um, members. Right. So, um, and again, we try to credit people for their their seniority in other departments. Um, so, yes. All right, thank you. Um, counselors, I'm looking for hands. Um, in the meantime, while you're, if you're gathering some thoughts, uh, Alan, I'm wondering if you could come back. There's some questions. I'm not sure that, um, well, I'll blame myself, not Counselor Jarrett. I think maybe the two of us have, um, made it more confusing about what happens if we vote against the budget or if we don't act on the budget um then less confusing and so i'm getting some questions maybe oops sorry let me unmute you maybe you could walk through it for us so a 45 day time clock starts from when the um mayor submits his proposed budget um and at the end of that 45 day clock if you haven't passed a budget, either the budget that the mayor has uh, recommended or that budget with amendments, then um, the mayor's budget goes into effect without the action of the council. And so what uh, Councilor Jarrett was properly pointing out, and I haven't done the math, um, but you would have to uh, have, if you, if you vote against it, you're going to have to have two more sessions to, well, then you have voted it down. We're losing you, Alan. Maybe take off your video. Solicitor's frozen. Um, Councilor Mary. Uh, you're oh. not going to be passing a budget. Oh, wow. It's like there was a ghost of- Frozen out there. I was just going to ask when the budget uh, date is with the revision. Is it still May 18th or is it a different date now? The 45 day count. Um, well, I, I can try to answer that. I don't know if the, can I speak to that or? Oh, yeah, sure. Oh yeah. I mean the, 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 um, you know, the charter says that, uh, our, under our, under our budget process that, um, 45 days, prior to the start of the fiscal year, I have to submit it. Um, and so I have done that. I've met that criteria. Um, in terms of an, the swap out of the order, I, don't, I think that that's, that's more within the council rules that allows that. I don't think that that restarts the budget clock um, because obviously I needed to have submitted something by the 18th. So 
because the the really the clock is the the deadline is the is the start of the new fiscal year. That's the that we have to have a budget in place. Got it. Thank you, Mayor. Um, has the city solicitor been able to resume restore his sound or? Looks like yes, maybe. Uh, oh. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So uh, I I lost you there at the end of what you were saying, Mayor. But the clock starts when the budget is submitted by the mayor. A 45-day clock starts. And at the end of that 45-day clock, if a budget hasn't been passed, the mayor's budget goes into effect. And that's according to our charter. Um, what does Mass General Law say on it? On that point, uh, our charter tracks uh, Chapter 44, Section 32 pretty closely. Okay. But our charter definitely controls on that point because it's very specific on that point. Um, Councillor Jarrett, oops, I just muted you. Um, yeah, and just to clarify uh, that, that, so to clarify to people, the way to reduce uh, any of the items in the budget is through an amendment. Now the amendment must pass and then the budget must pass. Is that correct? Yes. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Counselors. So we know that so the motion on the table is to adopt the FY 2021 general fund budget minus the, uh, the, the line item that we have separated out. If there's no, is there any further discussion on the adoption? Okay. Hearing none, roll call please, Laura, again on the adoption of the general fund budget. We will take up the order in a little bit. Councilor Foster. Yes. Councilor Jarrett. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Mayori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Thorpe. Yes. And Councillor Dwight. Oops. Yes. Okay. So that has that motion to adopt has passed in first reading. Um, now we're at step uh, four on the process. So I am gonna ask Councillor Jarrett, Councillor Jarrett, you're welcome to speak to this if you'd like to. Um, yeah, I think I spoke to it before. It pertains a, or I have a conflict of interest um, in case anyone wasn't here at the beginning. It's related to a pre-existing contract that the Pedal People Cooperative has with the city. So Councillor Jarrett's gonna remove himself and we are going to now um, take up that line item that we had separated. So, uh, oh, are you ready, Councillor Dwight? Yes, I, I move to approve the item that was removed or do I have to reiterate all the, uh, the, the, uh, I'll, the contract? I'll, I'll just help a little. Okay, move go for it. The $38,000 line item in the central services parking maintenance budget for the pedal people contract. Yeah, what she said. Is there Second. it was seconded. Okay. Um, so now discussion on just this line item, the thirty-eight thousand dollar pedal people contract, which is um uh, in the central services parking maintenance budget. Um I was gonna try and give you all a page number if you 
like it. Oh, right here, which is on page 49 of your budget book. Councillor Dwight. Uh, a question for the solicitor. Uh, Alan, is there a way that Councillor Jarrett can avoid this uh, in, I assume, next year's budget? I'm going to presume that the contract uh, would extend beyond that. And is there a way that he can preemptively cope with this so that, that he doesn't have to go through these uh, acrobatic handsprings? As long as he has any financial interest in any matter that's being deliberated by the council, he has to recuse himself. And so if he still has ownership interest it's gonna, and, and the pedal people still has a contract, it's going to be the same thing. I understand. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay. Seeing and hearing none, roll call please on this line item. We'll start with Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Maori. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Quinlan. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Thorpe. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. And Councilor Foster. Yes. Okay. That uh, passes in first reading. Now we are going to take the, hold on, wrong mouse. We're going to take the most, we're going to uh, take up the order. Um, which is now 20.065 in order to approve the FY 2021 general fund budget. Um, I read this in its, I read the previous version in its entirety last time. I uh, would imagine you probably don't wish to have me read it again. Um, but uh, council president yes would, would you um merely read the item that has uh that's being proposed that has changed yes so the item that has changed is under public safety police under personal services five million nine hundred and fifty thousand two hundred and sixty two under ordinary maintenance 604,244 under other than ordinary maintenance, 146,252. This is for a total of 6,700,758. Okay. Um, so, is there a motion to approve the order FY 2021 general fund budget in its entirety? Um, Y'all are with me, right? Okay. So this is the order. We have just, we previously adopted the general fund budget. This is an, a motion to approve the order of the general fund budget in its entirety. Councillor Nash. I will make that motion to approve the FY 2021 budget. Motion's been made by Councillor Nash. I'll Is second. there, say again? I'll second. Oh, count, seconded by Councillor Thorpe. Okay, <laughs> now, discussion. Yes. Shh. 
Okay. Councilor Mayori. I, I honestly was torn about what to do about tonight with this. And now I feel like uh, with this week and the second reading um, next Thursday that I'm willing to vote for it with the understanding we have a week to see some structural, um, some fundamental uh, plan put out uh, that will address a lot of the residents' concerns and, and make everyone feel like we're really on a path here. Thank you. Thank you. Other, uh, Councillor Quinlan. I feel, I feel so similarly uh, to what Councillor Maiori just said and, and Councillor Foster and Councillor Jarrett and Councillor Nash and Councillor Thorpe and Councillor Dwight, <laughs> Councillor Labarge, we've all kind of feeling this way that, I mean, you know, as a as a first term counselor here, this has been, oh uh, boy, um, it's been a really amazing week. I, I never anticipated this, even last week, that this week would draw this emotion from me, and it and it's been this way for three days now, and it's it's unbelievable to hear so many people turn up to tell us what they feel, and to have to try to take what they feel and put it into words and put it into the budget and, and hold the mayor accountable and ask for accountability from the police department. It's, it's been a spectacular experience. It, and, and so I'm so grateful to, um, to everyone that spoke. I'm so grateful to the council here tonight because I think this has been a very productive discussion and, and I feel, feel much the same way. I'm, I'm comfortable saying this um, I'm comfortable voting for this uh, now, and, and I look forward to, to the progress that's made just in the next eight days. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Quinlan. Councillor Foster. Oh, I'm unmuted. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Quinlan and Councillor Mayori. Um, I also just wanted to take the opportunity to say that I've, I've struggled um, I do intend to vote yes, um, and that's in part because I recognize that turning this great action, like Councilor Quinlan alluded to, into the details of the how is where our work is right now. And I'm I'm committed, and I and I hear commitment all around to that how, and I'm looking forward to doing it. And for that reason, I'll be voting yes tonight. Thank you, Councilor Labarge. Um, I'm just wondering if we've heard so much of what the mayor would definitely do by the time we have our, our reading. A little louder, please. I, I'm, I'm very concerned because we're hearing a commitment from the mayor. And I'm wondering if, can a counselor make a motion to make an amendment? To the budget of that commitment that the mayor is talking about when we come back in well june 18th of knowing mayor that you have made a commitment and you're gonna do what you're gonna do to make things work for everybody in the community and also us counselors i'm just wondering if possibility can that be done because people are hearing you and it's like a commitment you're making. Um, so counselor, the commitment that I've made is to, is to sit down with the leadership of the city council and to um, discuss a framework that we can potentially agree to for how we will advance this critical community conversation. You know, looking at these issues that we've been hearing um, from from residents um, for the uh, over the last three nights that these hearings have been open, um, and coming up with some kind of a framework um, for how we move it forward. That's the commitment that I'm making. And other, you know, beyond the other commitments I've stated, that if we, if and when we, when we complete that work and we have a set of um, a set of recommendations that come out of it, I'm committed to to trying to work with the council to 
advance those. But for tonight, the commitment is to come back to the council um, with something um, next week, I believe, that I try to work out with the council president. Is that is that your understanding, council president? <laughs> Am I misrepresenting it? Yeah, okay. No, no, no. I, I, yep. I look forward to sitting down with you in the next week um, and, and working on this and having something to report on at the next meeting. Councillor Dwight. And just to be clear, there's no amendment that we can make that would require the mayor to um, say or do anything, particularly as it relates to a budget vote here. You do have the authority to vote down that budget or even propose an amendment to that budget on uh, not, uh, not next week, not tomorrow, but the following Thursday. So there is there is no we wouldn't want to make an amendment well we, we couldn't make an amendment we would have any wouldn't have any weight or value i think uh, you've heard from the mayor that he he and the council president are committed to uh to to see this through and have this conversation and then it's up to us to decide if um what they're proposing is adequate that's all that's that's enough right there Councilor Nash. Yeah, I'd like to thank our council president and our mayor for their willingness to engage in this conversation to come up with, you know, a, a plan uh, it, after so many budget changes, so many moving parts that have been going on over the last few months. And to add this last, this, this additional piece, I know how hard you both are working. I really appreciate it, so thank you. Thank you, I welcome the conversation. Um, Councillor uh, Councilor Quinlan's having circuit breaker issues. Um, uh, Councillor Labarge. Um, Councillor Gina Loscara, our council president, I wanna thank you for all the long hours that you spent and with any other kind of complaints that you've gotten, You've done an excellent job, and I want to thank you very, very much for making it happen. We've had long hours and so forth. Even though I had problems with my computer, you were excellent to work with. And I, I just want to tell the counselors that, you know, I am hearing what people are saying out there, and that's where my concern is of what they're asking us to do and to make sure that we involve them. And I'm, I'm not hearing that. I'm hearing about counselors working along. Gina Louise is gonna be working with the mayor, which is excellent. But we need to involve. You're hearing, every one of you counselors have heard about having and forming a committee, which is extremely valuable here in the city to do that. Yes, we're gonna work with the mayor the executive and the legislative part of the body. But we still got to keep in mind that we have all these people asking to have a committee formed on the outside, which Councillor Thorpe talked about also. There is a lot of value there. We need to make that happen for all the people who have spoke about having that happen. So we don't want to leave them away from that. So I think that this committee should be formed with constituents in the city and um, having some legal power there of seeing and looking at the policies and what goes on in that police station. People are asking for that. So I'm going to have trust in my, in my constituents and the residents in the city of Northampton. I think they're asking for something that should be put in place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I thank you for your kind words. As I, as I always say, this is a team effort. Um, so I thank all of you. Um, and we hear you, Councillor Labarge. I think that you know Mayor Narkowitz, hear what you're saying. I think that that certainly um, will be in our discussion. And um, we, as you said, we're, we'll work on putting together a framework, and that will be informed by everything that we've heard, including what you've now mentioned multiple times tonight. Thank you. Um, 
Councillor Mayori. Yeah, I just want to uh, thank Councillor Barge for her, her words. I, I really appreciate that. And also I thank you as well, um, Councillor Shara. You know, I'm, I'm torn about this. I feel like what, I, what I'm, I just wanna make clear that I was prepared to vote this budget uh, against this budget tonight and I'm prepared to do it next week. And it will really have to do with what happens specifically in the next week, um, just so you understand where I'm coming from. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, counselors, any, any further discussion uh, to the question on the floor, the motion on the floor, which is the order to approve the FY 2021 general fund budget. Okay, seeing no further comments. Laura, when you're ready, roll call, please. Hold on. Yes. Councilor Nash. Councilor Nash. Oh, I didn't hear Laura. Yes. Yeah, Laura, you're very quiet for some reason. You know what? Maybe my hand is over the microphone. Um, Councillor Quinlan? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Foster? Yes. And Councillor Labarge? Uh, Councillor Labarge? Yes. Okay. All right. So that, oh, I have lost my agenda. Um, that passes in first reading. That um, is the only item on the agenda, but I'd still feel better if I could see it. I move to adjourn. Back it up. Laura, I'm right, there's nothing else, right? Nothing else. Okay, motion's been made to adjourn and seconded. Roll call, please, on adjourning. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor Quinlan? Hard to yes. hear. Still, huh? Okay. Councillor Quinlan? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Thorpe? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Foster? Yes. Councillor Jarrett? Yes. Councillor Labarge? Yes. And Councillor Mayori? Okay, thank you. We are adjourned. Our next meeting is, as I said, uh, it's Thursday, June 18th, 7 p.m.